So once again, good morning to everybody and welcome at this uh, morning session. Uh, we have uh, several communications, so I propose that we do not wait uh, further. And I call for the first presentation by uh, Professor Kumuro, New Molecular Mechanism of Heart Failure. I also must say that unfortunately, Dr. Davis could not make it, so uh, she will not be close to me in the podium. So, Professor Kumuro. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, for introduction. And first of all, I'd like to express thanks to uh, Jay and Keiichi uh, for inviting me uh, to such a uh, wonderful meeting. Also, I'm not a person of regeneration. I really uh, enjoyed the wonderful science, a uh, good friendship, and also uh, Kyoto. OK, I have nothing to be disclosed. So in Japan, uh, there are uh, 1.2 million heart failure patients. The number of heart failure uh, patients is increasing. So we say that the heart failure pandemic. Uh, this uh, situation is not uh, only uh, observed only in Japan, but also all over the world. So uh, Eugene Brownwald said that uh, the war on heart failure. Uh, 16 years ago, uh, we have reported that pressure overload induced cardiomyocyte hypertrophy uh, leading to ischemia. So ischemia uh, induces angiogenesis by upregulating HIF-1 and angiogenic growth factors. So angiogenesis ameliorates ischemia and induces cardiac hypertrophy with normal cardiac function, function at least the systolic function. But long-term pressure overload uh, inhibits angiogenesis. angiogenesis and leading to the uh, heart failure. So how uh, angiogenesis is inhibited? We found that the P53 is uh, uh, expressed in cardiomyocyte, which inhibits HIH-1. So how P53 is induced in cardiomyocyte? Uh, there are many factors to or can induce P53, but we uh, asked DNA damage. Of course, DNA damage is the most uh, well-known a simulator for P53. So we used the uh, same model, TAC model, to uh, um, examine the DNA damage in cardiomyocyte. Uh, Comet assay uh, revealed that uh, there is a single sun breaks in cardiomyocyte after pressure overload. And uh, to know the role of the DNA damage, we used XRCC1 knockout mice. XRCC1 is uh, very famous. Uh, single strand DNA uh, repair uh, molecule. So, XRCC1 knockout mice, there is accumulation of DNA damage, single strand breaks. And this uh, model, uh, mild pressure overload easily induced heart failure. So, I think that the DNA damage in cardiomyocyte can cause heart failure. Uh, we have reported many mechanisms of heart failure. Uh, recently, uh, ischemia, inflammation, aging, and uh, regeneration. But uh, I, I used uh, uh, genetically modified mice, but uh, I still don't know uh, human heart failure mechanisms. So we changed the uh, uh, direction a little bit, and we examined the genome analysis and the single cell analysis using uh, human samples. First, we made a, a panel for our, our direct cardiomyopathy, and we found that the uh, uh, most frequent mutation is a tight gene truncation. The second is a lamin variance. It is interesting that uh, there are a tremendous difference between two uh, mutations. Uh, Titan truncation variants respond to drug treatment and uh, show the uh, reverse remodeling. However, uh, lamin mutation do not respond to drug treatment uh, and do not show uh, left ventricle reverse remodeling. The prognosis is the same. The Titan uh, mutation patients uh, do not show the arrhythmia or uh, heart failure. Uh, in contrast, lamin mutation patients show the uh, lethal or arrhythmia and severe heart failure, and the others are intermediate. So this really suggests that uh, uh, we can do a present medicine by examining DNA of uh, direct cardiomyocyte and myopsy patients. If uh, titan mutation patients, uh, we can treat them uh, with uh, regular medical treatment as inhibitors, ALB or beta blocker, MRA. Now, however, 
Uh, Lamy immediate patient uh, do not respond to the treatment, we should prepare the LBAT or transplantation. Uh, we uh, recently uh, have, have done uh, uh, GBIS analysis and we made the polygenic risk scores. Uh, polygenic risk scores predict the, uh, the, uh, uh, whether uh, the, he is prone to the myocardial infarction or a heart failure. And uh, there are many uh, SNPs, you know, and uh, we uh, uh, classified the SNPs, uh, such as uh, uh, cholesterol, the deep diabetes, our inflammation. So, uh, PRS, polygenic risk scores, can tell uh, whether you are prone to myocardial infarction and heart failure. So people who are genetically prone to the disease uh, must manage their uh, lifestyle more strictly. And also, uh, genome analysis revealed that the main cause of myocardial infarction in a person and the effective prevention methods. So, uh, so that uh, we can do a person prevention. We have also done uh, uh, GBIS analysis for uh, atrial fibrillation. So we found uh, uh, many novel uh, SNPs and we uh, made uh, uh, project risk scores also. And the project risk scores predict the uh, cardiogenic stroke and uh, cardiovascular death and uh, stroke death. And also we found that the ERRG a binding site, ERRG is estrogen receptor related gamma. Uh, binding site is con concentrated in the uh, area of the SNP uh, by chip analysis. So we next uh, then, uh, uh, so ERG is really responsible to atrial fibrillation uh, by using uh, IPS cardiomyocyte. So there is a uh, ERG inhibitor, GSK F51A2. Now, if we uh, add GSK F51A2, uh, the expression levels of the I many ion channels are downregulated, and uh, cardiac motion, uh, cardiomyocyte motion is abnormal, and the calcium handling is also abnormal, and the contraction duration is uh, uh, beating rate is decreased and concept, uh, context and duration is elongated. So, okay. So genome analysis and the IPS experiments identify the gene which is responsible uh, to atrial fibrillation. Next, I want to talk about uh, uh, single cell analysis. So first we uh, did a single cell analysis uh, for uh, mice and uh, pack after TAC experiment, pressure overload, uh, cardiomyocyte, uh, this uh, dot uh, means uh, uh, one cardiomyocyte, and uh, we, um, so the expression uh, patterns are, are very similar to, uh, similar. And the first uh, pressure overload uh, induces uh, uh, different expression levels of the many genes, and they uh, go two ways. And these cells express uh, very abnormal cardiomyocyte genes. Now, uh, while these cardiomyocytes show the relatively normal uh, gene expressions, so we say that the failing cardiomyocyte and adaptive cardiomyocyte, why they divide two ways? So we uh, determine the ex uh, genes in the branch point. We found these genes are concentrated here, and these genes uh, have a common uh, upstream molecule, that is a P53. And uh, P53 downstream molecule, P21, is expressed or co-localized uh, with gamma H2X, so that the DNA damage activates P53 and overexpression of P P21. So we made uh, a P53 cardiomyocyte and knockout mice, and these mice do not show the heart failure after pressure overload. And the single cell analysis, these uh, uh, reveal that uh, these are uh, failing cardiomyocytes. These cardiomyocytes only observed in the wild type, not uh, P53 knockout mice. So we performed the single cell analysis uh, also for human heart failure patients. And normal, uh, no, normal heart shows uh, very homogeneous expression patterns, uh, whereas uh, uh, failing heart showed the 
in homogeneous expressions like this. And also in the human, there are two pathways, adaptive and failing. In the failing, cardiomyocytes express a lot of DNA damage response genes. So we focus the DNA damage uh, and uh, using uh, uh, poly-ADP ribose antibody, uh, we stain the uh, um, patient uh, specimens. And there is a, a, a patient who showed a lot of DNA damage, and this patient uh, showed uh, less DNA damage. So what is the difference? The difference is uh, uh, reverse remodeling or not. Of course, uh, uh, patients with a lot of DNA damage do not show the uh, left ventricular reverse remodeling, uh, whereas uh, uh, patient always out of DNA damage show the reverse remodeling. Of course, this patient, uh, the prognosis is very good. So uh, recently, we have performed uh, this analysis uh, for many heart failure patients with a variety of the causes, that the cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, hypertensive heart disease, amyloidosis, et cetera. And there's a very good correlation between the DNA damage and left ventricular remodeling. So this is suggest that the DNA damage is a common cause, a common pathway in the heart failure, uh, irrespective of the uh, heart failure causes. So, so this is a single cell analysis of mice and a human, the, the same patterns, and the failing cardiomyocyte uh, express a lot of inflammatory cytokines, which is uh, usually expressed by the DNA damage or the senescent cells. We uh, performed the machine learning, uh, and we found that the IJBP7 is most correlated the uh, time uh, course of the heart failure. The IJBP7 is upregulated in the heart failure patients and downregulated after cardiac transplantation. This pattern is very similar to NTP or BNP. So IGBP7 has been already reported to be a b very good biomarker, not only HFREF, but also HFEF. But we uh, found that uh, if over except IGBP7, cardiac dysfunction is exacerbated. And interestingly, we made a vaccine against the IGBP7. So vaccine can treat or prevent the heart failure. Uh, we also uh, performed a single cell analysis uh, for uh, heart failure uh, patients and the heart failure mice. And we found that the uh, dopamine receptor D1, DRD1, is marked activated in, in the part of the cardiomyocyte. And uh, DRD1 is highly, uh, highly expressed in, in a, a part of the cardiomyocyte of the patients with cardiomyopathy with critical VT or, and or ICD. And uh, we uh, performed in vitro uh, experiments, and we found that the overexpression of DRD1 induces a phosphorylation of the receptor and induces a calcium spark and arrhythmia. So I think that um, overexpression of DRD1 in the heart failure, uh, uh, failing hearts um, may be uh, one cause of the uh, suddenness or arrhythmia in the heart failure patients. We also performed a single cell analysis for uh, cardiac uh, cardiac fibroblast. Uh, cardiac fibroblast um, has an intimate relationship with many uh, other cell types, cardio not only cardiomyocytes but also endothelial cells, or pericyte, macrophage. So we focused on cardiac fibroblast, and we found that this network is expressed in uh, cardiac fibroblast, and in the center of the network there is a HER3. HER3 is known to be a cell in protease, but uh, the role of the HER3 in the heart had not been known. So we first knock, knock out the HER3 in mice and found that the knock out mice showed a uh, severe heart failure after attack. And there is a uh, uh, failing cardiomyocyte which expressed uh, uh, DNA damage, P53 uh, signaling and tissue beta signaling. So uh, since HER3 is a cell in protease, we focus and on the relationship between the tissue beater and the heart of three. And we found that the heart of three bound to a tissue beater and degrades tissue beater. So in conclusion, the pressure overload uh, first uh, increased the expression of tissue beater and also inhibits the heart of three, uh, leading to the uh, uh, very extensive activation of the tissue beater. So leading to a fibrosis. Fibrosis, first fibrosis is important or necessary uh, to maintain the heart 
uh, against uh, uh, strong pressure overload. But the too much fibrosis is not good, of course. And also, activation is better, not only acts on the fibroblast, but also cardiomyocyte and uh, induces the uh, DNA damage uh, by uh, upregulating a loss and downregulating the DNA repair enzymes. So we performed a, a trans, uh, spatial uh, transcriptome analysis using a BISM. So we uh, made a microdine infarction mice, and there is a very clear uh, differences in expressions uh, among the infarcto area and the border area and the remote area. Then we focus on the uh, border zone. A border zone expresses a lot of genes which are um, mechanism sensitive genes. So in the, sen uh, in the center of the network, there is a CSRP3 here. So we knocked down the CSRP3 and found that the, uh, this mice showed a uh, uh, severe reverse, uh, se severe uh, remodeling after microdial infarction. So this is suggest that uh, uh, mechanism sensitive genes, uh, including uh, CSRP3, is upregulated in the border zone after microdial infarction and inhibits the remodeling after MRI. So I as I mentioned, that the uh, uh, LAMI uh, mutation is uh, induced a severe heart failure in human. So we made uh, knocking mice uh, using uh, uh, crystal Cas9 system. And this mice showed a direct cardiomyopathy like human. And sarcomere is immature and uh, nu uh, nuclear shape is very uh, bizarre. And uh, we also made uh, iPS cells from the patients. And uh, iPS derived cardiomyocytes showed uh, uh, different expression patterns compared with estrogen control. Uh, Lamy variants showed uh, uh, less, uh, cardi less cardiomyocyte uh, which expressed the mitochondria and the sarcomere. Uh, in contrast, they express a lot of the DNA damage and the cell cycle genes here. So why uh, uh, lamin uh, mutation, uh, IPS cardiomyocytes are so immature? So we performed the RNA sequence analysis and also attack sequence. Then we found that uh, uh, cluster zero, um, there, are, uh, there are less cluster zero in uh, RNA seq and uh, attack seq. And that actually revealed that uh, uh, these uh, sequences, and, uh, these genes with these sequences are downregulated. So this sequence is known to be a, the site uh, where the TET, transcript factor TET uh, bound, binds. Okay. So our protein, analysis, our protein array analysis revealed that um, a TED bound to the um, mutant uh, lamin, not normal lamin. So uh, IP Besson also re revealed that the TET are bound to the mutant uh, lamin. Uh, this is a, a collected IPS cardiomyocyte. TET is a diffusely expressed in the nucleus. In contrast, lamin mutant IPS cells, uh, lamin is not diffusely distributed, is co-localized the nuclear membrane. And TET uh, itself and the downstream molecules are downregulated. So in conclusion, we think that the uh, TED is important for cardiomyocyte maturation. However, lamin mutation, uh, TED is trapped in the nuclear membrane and cannot activate uh, uh, many genes. So um, we think DNA damage is very important, common mechanism of heart failure. Actually, lamin mutation, human, IPS, mice, show the uh, DNA damage in cardiomyocyte. So using uh, a human IPS cardiomyocyte, we screened the drugs to um, reduce the DNA damage. We found a compound E, substance E, uh, effectively inhibits the DNA damage. And uh, compound E uh, repair the uh, expression patterns of genes. And also in vivo, uh, compound E uh, reduced the DNA damage. And interestingly, compound E uh, induced uh, uh, repairs or ameliorate the cardiac function. So I have no time to say summary. Okay. Uh, so, uh, lastly, I want to say thank uh, these members. Uh, Senator Nomura, uh, he, he talked uh, yesterday. 
and Central Yamada on the uh, mathematics. Uh, Ito uh, did the uh, IPS studies, uh, Central Yamada uh, did uh, uh, sequence attack sequence. The uh, Toshiki Ko uh, did uh, uh, poly ADP rival staining. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this uh, impressive amount of data and insights into new mechanisms. So uh, this communication is open for discussion. Professor Jaka. Thank, thank you very much for sharing such uh, an impressive amount of data. So what is the mechanism by which uh, uh, LAMI mutations sequester TL1 at the motor envelope? Um, I don't know the process mechanism that uh, um, mutant lamin bound to a TED. Corrected lamin do not bind to TED. So TED is trapped in the nuclear membrane where there are uh, mutant lamin exist. But you don't have any idea of the mechanism. <laughs> I'm sorry? You don't know the, what the mechanism is. Mm, what mechanism? I don't know. Well, what is the molecular mechanism? A molecular mechanism. Uh, I just hypothesize that uh, mutant lamin, of course, that their uh, structure should be changed, and that uh, structure change uh, make uh, TED bound to the uh, lamin. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great talk. Uh, just want to go back to y the part of your talk uh, where you talked about dopamine receptors. So these dopamine receptors were expressed in cardiomyocytes, not in the uh, endothelial cells, correct? So uh, that's something I didn't know, that dopamine receptors are actually expressed in cardiomyocytes. It makes sense that they have, you know, beta receptors, but why do cardiomyocytes have dopamine receptors? Under what physiological condition does do cardiomyocytes respond to dopamine, which is mostly expressed in response to, you know, emotional, um, you know, uh, response to, to different stimuli in the body? So. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, you know, yeah. s speculate on that? Dopamine receptor uh, B1 is expressed in cardiomyocytes and probably other cells, but uh, ex expression level is not so high. I don't know why, but uh, pressure overload or uh, pressure overload that were fading cardiomyocytes, only a uh, um, small part of the cardiomyocyte expresses uh, very high levels of the dopamine receptor. So dopamine receptor one, the signaling is almost same as uh, beta receptors, but uh, uh, overexpression of the DRD1 activates a lot of the cyclo-MP or calcium, and which leads to the uh, superphosphorylation of large receptor. I don't know why the uh, only a part of the cardiomyocyte expressed uh, highly of the DRD1. I don't know why. Last and quick question, and please uh, quick answer. Yeah, uh, let me ask about the uh, Lamy A and uh, part. So I, I think you said the uh, Lamy A mutation caused DNA damage, and you also said it's uh, mutant Lamy A bound to TET1. Is that any correlation or uh, consequence, that which is upstream, downstream, something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, of course, DNA damage is induced by a variety of the uh, causes. Uh, of course, it's easy to uh, imagine that the uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, which is uh, very much produced in cardiomyocyte, mitochondria or the NADPH or the oxidase, but uh, there are many other uh, causes to induce DNA damage. And probably, I think a DNA damage is a common cause of the heart failure, but uh, the uh, course, the pathway is different in the initial causes. And the LAMI mutation, so one mechanism is uh, abnormal transcription, transcription. And interestingly, there are many DNA repair uh, enzymes, uh, DNA repair molecules, uh, which are downregulated in LAMI mutation. And uh, also, um, I don't remember the name, but uh, so lamin is a nuclear membrane. So lamin mutation is, uh, induces the weakness of the uh, nuclear membrane. So there is a lot of the DNA damage repair enzymes in the nucleus, 
uh, those enzymes go uh, out uh, from the nucleus to the cyt cytoplasm. That is uh, one cause of the DNA damage in lamin mutation. So probably there are many kinds of the DNA damage uh, causes in the lamin mutation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we move on now to uh, the next presentation by uh, Professor Chong, Protein and Peptide Therapeutics, the Repair of the Infarction Heights. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Professor Fukuda and Jiang for this um, opportunity to present some of our work. It's been such a fantastic meeting. Um, I'm an interventional cardiologist at um, Westmead Hospital in Sydney, and I also run a basic science group focused on heart regeneration or repair. Um, a lot of this meeting's talked about the myocytes, and our group is also working on IPSC derived myocytes, um, working towards a phase one clinical trial. But um, I won't be talking about any of that today. I, I shared some of that data last year. It's in preprint form. Please feel free to, to take a look. Hopefully, it'll be published soon. I'd rather like to talk about a couple of proteins that um, change the, the um, post-infarct matrix. And we've heard a lot about the importance of, of changing the matrix in overall to here, uh, to, to get cardiac repair. The first protein is PDGF-AB. Um, this is a protein that um, I've had a long interest in since um, doing my PhD with Richard Harvey. At that time, we were a focus on a group of cells that we thought had cardiac MSC-like ability and on its surface markers, amongst others, proteins, it also expressed PDGF receptor alpha. And many of you will know that PDGF signaling is quite complex. The ligands exist in either homodimeric or heterodynamic form um, for chains A, B, C and D. And then these combinations also interact with um, tyrosine kinases, which ex uh, exist in hetero or homodimeric form for alpha and beta chains. The in vitro um, interactions had been pretty work, uh, well worked out since, um, well, for some time now, but the in vivo interactions really hadn't been. And our focus on PDGFAB, we hope, helps some of this. So Richard initially started in a mouse model of myocardial infarction, delivering PDGFAB and showing that cardiac function was improved after myocardial infarction. That we took that preliminary study and then went on to a clinically relevant large animal of myocardial infarction in the pig. Um, we um, infused PDGFAB by osmotic mini pump shortly after myocardial infarction. And you can see by the MRI analysis that the PDGF treated group in the blue was significantly improved compared to the um, vehicle control in the red, and it's the deltas um, below. Now, the pig's not the best model to work out exactly what's going on, but we did find some um, interesting findings. Um, firstly, that the scar size between the groups didn't change, and that was a surprise to us. Um, we, we saw quite significant functional improvement but um, by Picrosirius red or Gamori's trichrome, there was no real difference in the scar. So, well, well not in the quantity of the scar. But by um, second harmonic generation, two photon imaging, and also um, uh, biorefringent my microscopy, we, we felt that we saw the collagen alignment of these fibers change significantly and more straighter and aligned in the PDGFAB. We also did um, analysis in 2D sections and in 3D um, sections by cubic clearance and found that the PDGFAB treated animals did have more vessels that were smaller and more branched. But we didn't, didn't really know what was going on. And um, Rob Hume in my group, who's, who's just recently left, was set the task of trying to dissect this out a little further. Now, as mentioned, we're really focusing on the matrix, so we thought fibroblasts. He set up cultures of cardiac fibroblasts, um, first treating them with FPS-containing media, um, which were serum-starved to some degree, um, treating with PDGF-AB or as a positive control TGF-beta-1, or the combination of both. You can see PDGFs had this characteristic stringy phenotype compared to the fat and flat um, myofibroblasts. 
And um, actor 2 expression correlating with these um, smooth muscle cells was decreased in the PDGF treatment, that's in the green, compared to the TGF treated samples. And a similar finding when we looked on Western blot for um, expression of SMA and the um, quantification of the densimetry on the right. We did um, RNA sequencing on the cultured cells and you see that compared to the untreated um, controls in the middle here, the PDGF samples, which is on the left of screen, clustered differently to the TGF beta samples, which I suppose is not unexpected. But this was particularly interesting to us, that the PDGF AA homodimer um, appeared relatively weak, um, clustering closer to the untreated controls. And the PDGA, uh, PDGF AB heterodimer clustered closer to the PDGF BB het homodimer. And that was si a similar um, result in the, the combinations of um, PDGFs and TGF beta. When we looked at what genes were um, differentially expressed, periostin was um, strongly expressed throughout the PDGF and the um, TGF beta one samples. Um, but there were differences between the groups. Um, I'll draw your attention to the top left-hand corner. Um, these genes down, um, down regulated by PDGF were interesting, particularly SRF1 and MBNL1, which has recently been shown by the Gen Davis group to be necessary for um, collagen 1, um, uh, myofibroblast um, formation and cardiac fibrosis. We then turned back to the mouse model of myocardial infarction, trying to employ a technique known as imaging mass cytometry. Many of you will know this. You can conjugate up to 30 antibodies with metal isotopes and um, get a lot of information um, by time of flight microscopy where um, the, the uh, spatial um, location of the cells is preserved and you can really multiplex the different groups of cells. We designed our antibody panel really to get at the immune system. Um, to cut a long story short, the, the data was difficult to analyse and a little confusing. Um, really the only finding that we took home was that PDGF significantly down-regulated a particular group of cardiac fibroblasts in the um, ischemic zones on the right here and the border zones as well. We turn back to our pig model. So the initial paper that I showed at the start of the talk was at a day 28 time point. This is part of a time course. We're looking day earlier now, day 11. We've also got animals going out to day 60. So at, at this early time point, we see that there's already a trend to um, injection fraction improvement. We saw similar collagen changes that we saw at day 28. And we looked at RNA sequencing, um, e the P PDGF down-regulated inflammatory signals and, and, and change those interferons um, related with um, inflammation also. So look, this, this group of findings hopefully just shows in multiple species that PDGF-AV really does impact the um, scar formation after myocardial infarction. We think it does that by decreasing um, myofibroblast differentiation and proliferation. And there's also some effects on the immune system um, early after um, myocardial infarction. The next protein that I'd like to talk about is tropoelastin. And um, this series of experiments came about when we considered, well, how do we change the very thick and um, uh, rigid collagen-rich scar that occurs after myocardial infarction? And we contrasted this to other organs like the skin or like um, vascular trauma and lungs, which highly contain elastin and are stretchy. So tropoelastin is a cellular Sol soluble, sorry, monomer protein of um, elastin. And we were lucky in an institute to collaborate with Tony Weiss, who has spent a lot of time creating methods for recombinant human um, tropoelastin um, production. And he's done well commercializing it for um, wound repair. So we collaborated with him, and we put it through our rat model of myocardial infarction injecting tropoelastin on day four after um, infarct creation and, and doing echocardiography at multiple time points. To limit the multiple thoracotomies, um, we injected tropoelastin by high-frequency ultrasound guidance into the LV wall. 
So left ventricular ejection fraction initially, um, you can see it tropolastin in green. It'll be the same colours as we go through the slides. Significant improvement compared to the um, control. In the blue is tropoelastin only. Now you'll see that there's no change, which is interesting. So that's saying that uh, tropoelastin needs something in the myocardial infarct creation to, to produce the elastin fibres and the delta changes on the right of the screen there. Um, echocardiography can also look at various parameters. Strain had been mentioned, I think, yesterday. So we also looked at strain um, measuring de deformation of, of the heart in, in various axes. So GLS shows the deformation in the longitudinal axis and as expected, there was a significant change between the tropolastin and the vehicle groups. Um, uh, the radial strain was more interesting to us. Now, what this measures is the deformation in the short axis change. And the graph on the right shows um, the, the delay in time to peak. So in the red, um, they're, they're not very well aligned, um, and that's because of the anterior wall, which is injured um, uh, um, by myocardial infarction. But the tropoelastin in the green has somewhat improved time to peak, and that's because you can see here in the anterior wall that was infarcted, but then also got tropoelastin. Um, that synchronisation is better now to the healthy um, myocardium. So this is telling us all of the action of the ejection fraction improvement is happening where the tropoelastin was being delivered to the damaged heart. When we looked at SCAR by Picker Sirius Red, um, there was a, a, a decrease in the SCAR in the tropoelastin. Again, maybe not too surprising, but the next question was, is the decrease in SCAR due to elastogenesis, which we hypothesised. So to get at this, we used a special stain known as Verhoff and Giesen, where elastin fibres come out as this strong purple. First thing to notice in the tropoelastin only, so tropoelastin no infarct, you get no increased elastin fibres. So presumably the soluble monomer um, is, is cleared somehow. The other interesting finding was that, in fact, without tropoelastin, we did see some elastin fibres, but not as much as when we delivered extra tropoelastin. And then here's the quantification here. Now, when you look through the literature, it, it is known, um, actually, that um, there is some elastogenesis in infarct repair, but it's, it's generally not very well known. We did RNA sequencing on these animals both at an early time point after tropolastin at day seven and as well day 11, a little bit later. First thing to note is that in the remote zone, so there's no differences between the groups. But um, in the ischemic zones, both at the early time point and the later time point, there was um, 7,950 7, um, differentially expressed genes. And we, when we look at the gene ontology terms, these are all really clustered around the immune signaling and extracellular um, matrix modulation, which is not that surprising. And another way to look at reactome analysis, um, uh, uh, to look at this data is reactome analysis. And I think it's interesting that at day seven, you get this term molecules associated with elastic fibers, but by day 11, that's gone. And um, very highly differentially expressed is um, extracellular matrix organisation at day seven, but again, that's um, almost gone by day 11. So this is telling us that a lot of the effects of tropoelastin um, ha happen early after myocardial infarction. So this was all in the rat. What about the human? We, we then looked at human cardiomyopathy samples, both ischemic and non-ischemic, and um, by um, immunocytochemistry, we did show the presence of tropoelastin, particularly in the fibrotic regions of, of, of these hearts. We looked at publicly available data sets um, and, and found that, you, that people do actually report, inc well, when you look at their data, you can find increased um, ELN, that's the gene encoding for elastin, um, increased in these cardiomyopathic hearts. And then finally, we cultured human cardiac fibroblasts, adding tropoelastin monomer to them and showing that after two weeks, these human cardiac fibroblasts can synthesize the tropoelastin to make their own elastin fibers. 
So um, I've hopefully shown you tropolastin has an underappreciated role in heart repair and that recombinant human tropolastin can improve cardiac function in a rat model of myocardial infarction. It does this by um, elastogenesis mediated by the um, activated fibroblasts in the infarct region and, and this raises possibilities for using recombinant human tropoelastin to um, repair infarct scar. Um, again, both of these studies were led by Rob Hume, a talented postdoc who's now left my group. Um, th thanks to everyone else in the group and, and important collaborators without whom um, the work couldn't have been done and of course the funding bodies. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this presentation is now open for a discussion. So may, may I start by asking mm. you, how do you conceive the uh, translational potential of these proteins? Yeah. Um, for the PDGF, it's quite hard. We've been working on that story for a long time. And you know, when we talk to people, because we don't have a specific mechanism, it's less appealing to them. Also, um, creating recombinant protein in, in large, l such large scale is hard. We, we're actually forming, um, we've got a, a few candidate peptides designed around key regions of what's known about the, the PDGF um, structures. And we're, we've got some promising in vitro results. They're going through in vivo testing now. Now, the tropoelastin is interesting because it's, um, it's being produced for clinical applications already in scale, but unfortunately the company AbbVie has the rights to that and they're really quite interested in just pushing down dermal indications. So looks, uh, we'd like to progress it through our large animal model, but they're not interested actually. And, and in your pig models, the administration was local, intramyocardial? It was. And what's av the average half-life of these proteins uh, once uh, injected? Yeah, that's a good question. So tr um, the PDGF is cleared very quickly, and we, it, we delivered that by osmotic mini, mini pumps so that slowly fused over a few days. Tropolastin was a single injection. We haven't measured half-life per se, but from our data, we think that it lasts several days, and, and the elastogenesis is happening in those first few days. Is there an, a question for Professor Chong? No? Well, otherwise, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> I think I, I just have to jump to the other place <laughs> to, to talk about extracellular vesicles for cardiac disease. Uh, I will share the uh, Philip Minesh presentation. So let's begin. Thank you very much. Well, I, I first would like really to echo my colleagues for thanking you, Professor Fukudai and Jay, for having put together this uh, really outstanding meeting uh, and the privilege of being here. Now, a couple of years ago, we uh, successfully completed the ESCORT trial in which embryonic stem cell-derived cardiovascular progenitor cells embedded in a fibrin patch were delivered epicardially in patients with uh, severe heart failure. And uh, incidentally, you will note that the first patient I operated on is now more than eight years after her surgery, still doing well, but importantly, no red signal regarding the safety of these cells. But at the same time, we did a head-to-head -head comparison between the transplantation of the cells and the administration of only their secret hole, trying to better understand the mechanism of action of the cells, and actually found similar outcomes, which led us to consider, as many others, that likely the primary mechanism of action was paracrine, mediated by a blend of biomolecules Many of these biomolecules being packaged in extracellular vesicles, not all, but many of them, with the possibility of duplicating the effects of the parental cells, but featuring the advantage for a given level of functional equivalence of being not immunogenic, which in the clinics really represents a major advantage. 
So we embarked in this program leading now to the secret HF trial. And here you see three words uh, highlighted in blue. And I will detail each of them starting in a reverse order. That is starting with the parental cells, the cardiovascular progenitor cells. Now, there is no fairly compelling evidence that if you want to have good EVs, you first need to have good parental cells. And it seems that these cells should meet two major criteria. Number one, they should be phenotypically as close as possible to the cells of the organ to be repaired in this particular case, so they should be cardiac committed. And number two, they should be early differentiated because the younger the cells, the richer, the secretone. And obviously this qualifies for the use of cardiovascular progenitor cells, the question being what could be the sources of these cells when we're thinking in terms of clinical applications. Well, one option might have been to take them from adult tissues, but we know that this raises a lot of issues I will not detail. Unfortunately, we now have pluripotent stem cells with this potential to give rise to cardiomyocytes at any stage, depending on how you culture them. And for this reason, and also for practicality reasons, we, we selected to use IPS as the parental cells. So basically, there is a sort of logical continuation with the escort trial, with the exception that we switched from ES to IPS as the source of the pluripotent stem cells, and with the second exception that the cells are no longer transplanted, but kept ex vivo as the producers of the secretome. These IPS were reprogrammed from emetopoietic stem cells, cultured and expanded to generate a, uh, a master and then a working cell bank. And this was part of a collaboration with Fuji CDI company in Madison. And obviously these two banks were extensively qualified for uh, a lot of uh, controls, including obviously their phenotype and uh, genetic stability. Then these pluripotent IPS were differentiated into cardiovascular progenitor cells, and actually we generated two separate banks from the same uh, IPS lot. And, and again, at the completion of the uh, differentiation process, these cells were again quality controlled. So at the end of this differentiation process, the cardiovascular progenitor cells were cryofrozen and crossed the Atlantic to arrive in our JMP facility in Paris. And here comes the second word, extracellular vesicle, that is the production now of the EVs. Well, once in Paris, these cryofrozen cells were thawed and expanded for a few days. Uh, they were cultured in a dedicated medium, reason being that obviously once we collected the conditioned medium, we wanted the medium to come exclusively from the cells and not being contaminated by any additive in the culture medium. At the end of uh, what has been termed the vesiculation process, uh, the cells once again were extensively quality controlled. That was the first step of the EV production. The second step was the purification and filtration. For this purpose, we use tangential flow filtration, which is currently the only method suitable for handling large volumes of conditioned medium under JMP conditions. Now, as you know, with TFF, you have a, a flux 
which circulates continuously parallel to the membrane, which gives you the possibility of selecting the, the size of the pores of the membrane. And depending on the size, obviously, you can retain or discard whatever you want. Well, after a, a series of experiments, we selected 30 kilodalton as the appropriate molecular cutoff, which means that, and I'm very keen about that, we're not talking about a specific exosome preparation. We're talking about a EV enriched secretome. And we, we haven't bored not only the EVs, but also a, a, a blend of soluble factors and cytokines and so on. Then we had the third and last step of this process, uh, the so-called fill and finish. I want to emphasize the fact that as previously mentioned, we had two preparations of cardiovascular progenitor cells and were able to show a very good reproducibility from one batch to the other. At the end, the conditioned media were pooled and the product intended to be given to the patient was also given to the animals undergoing the JLP safety, that is, tox and oncogenicity studies. So the animals undergoing these studies have received exactly the same product as the patients plan to be included in the clinical trial. Obviously, this final product had to undergo a series of quality controls. These are fairly standard controls. I will not detail them. Just a few words about the potency assays, and you know regulators are very keen about the potency assays. So just to illustrate that, this is one of the potency assay, an angiogenesis assay, the scratch wound. And here I think we can make three observations. Number one, this secretome and this is not really unexpected, has angiogenic effects with an increased and improved healing of the wound. Number two, uh, and again, it's not really unexpected, this effect is dose dependent. And number three, maybe more interesting, there is an acceptable reproducibility from one vial to the other. Now, this is a second potency assay, the stress assay, where cells are stressed by exposure to a pro-apoptotic agent. And, and you see that there was an improvement in uh, cell survival with uh, either the research grade uh, product or the clinical grade product. We also had to uh, do uh, extensive stability testing and so far, we have one year and very soon 18 month stability. And as you can see, if you look at the number of particles, it's fairly stable over time. And uh, in terms of bioactivity, again, uh, over time, it seems that these EVs, which have been uh, thought, uh, have retained their bioactivity with regard to the ability to improve survival of stressed cells. And then these uh, cryo-frozen vials have been uh, transported from the JMP facility in one of our hospitals in Paris to my own hospital to the ICU where they will be injected intravenously in the patients of the trial, which takes us to the third uh, section, so to speak, of the talk uh, related to the mode of delivery. So we selected to give these EVs, or say uh, EV-enriched secretome, intravenously for different reasons. Obviously, it's simple. Obviously, it's not invasive. But more importantly, because of this lack of invasiveness, it allows repeated administrations, which is likely critical to optimize the therapeutic benefit. Now, that said, this IV approach initially may look completely counterintuitive 
because if we look at the biodistribution patterns of intravenously injected EVs, we see that in a very consistent fashion, they home in the spleen primarily and also the lungs and the liver. Now, nevertheless, a survey of the literature shows that once injected intravenously, they do have cardioprotective effects. And interestingly, this is also shown in other diseases, in particular the brain. You have a lot of brain studies in which intravenously injected EVs got extremely positive results and improved outcomes in different models of brain disease. And actually, this data were confirmed by our own efficacy study in two animal models, a mouse model, a rat model of chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. This is the mouse study. I will not go into the details of the protocol, but as you can see, we injected intravenously the EVs at different time frame following the injection of doxorubicin. And uh, to make a long story short, compared with the placebo hearts, these animals injected intravenously at a better preservation of strain with a reduction in biomarkers for heart failure. These data obtained in mice were then duplicated in rats using this similar model of doxorubicin-induced cardiomyopathy with a significant reduction of left ventricular volume. So, to be honest, I don't have a clear explanation regarding the mechanism by which these intravenously injected EVs, and by the way, it's the same for cells, it has been shown for cells as well, are working, but the prevailing hypothesis is the so-called bioreactor hypothesis, whereby once trapped remotely in the spleen, lungs, and liver, these EVs, or their parents or cells, reprogram the endogenous immune cells towards a reparative pattern. For example, switching M1 macrophage into M2, or upregulating regulatory T cells. And at the end of the day, this reprogram endogenous immune cells behave as second mediators conveying the protective signals to the target organ as they traffic through the bloodstream. So obviously this hypothesis, which has been extensively studied in particular for the brain, still needs to be further confirmation for the heart, but at least that might be one possible mechanism by which these intravenously delivered therapeutics are working. So we are far from the physical presence of the therapeutic agent in the target organ, and here we more have to do with a uh, modulation of the systemic immune inflammatory response. So currently you have a bunch of trials using EVs or EV-enriched secretome in a variety of clinical indications to which now, as you can see, many of them, well, several of them are actually entailing the intravenous approach, and we can now add the uh, secret HF trial, which is uh, to start now very soon. That said, uh, I'd like once again to thank you for uh, the privilege of this indication and close by something which is real important for me, that is acknowledging the major contribution of all those who have made it possible over the, say, past 10 years. First, the group in my lab, and you will appreciate that I am a lucky man. Then the people at Fuji CDI, responsible for all the upstream steps the reprogramming of the IPS, their differentiation into cardiovascular progenitor cell, in particular Nisa Renault, who has played a pivotal role in the project. And obviously my colleagues in Paris of the JMP platform, responsible for all the downstream steps of this production process. And finally, 
our founding support. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Menash. Uh, is there any question and comment? Yes, please. Very wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question about the, the progenitor cells. So did you check the EB from carbomycite? No. I mean, is there a difference between progenitor versus carbomycite? Yes, you mean uh, a difference between EVs from major cardiomyocytes yeah. versus progenitors? Exactly. Yeah, we did. And actually, the major difference is the amount of EVs which are produced. You have many, many more EVs from progenitors than from major cardiomyocytes, and that was one reason for us to select progenitor cells rather than fully differentiated cardiomyocytes. We did a study initially in, in the lab, and uh, we, we found, and others have found the same. That is that more major cells may produce less EVs. Okay, thank you very much. Next question. <laughs> um, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, are you planning to do any studies to interrogate the content of the EVs to try to identify the, the active principles? And, and if so, do you foresee uh, this technology evolving to a, a state where we can engineer EVs to contain only what we want them to contain? Okay, I can easily answer the first part of your question, definitely, for the regulators we have to completely map the cargo so we know exactly what is in the cargo in terms of proteins. I can tell you more than 2,000 proteins are on board, and we also have the full map, and I had no time to detail that today, but we have the full map of the microRNAs and those which are the most extensively upregulated, and I will say that both the proteins and the microRNAs, which are the most overexpressed, uh, have targets which account for cardioprotective effects. That said, for the second part of your question, I think it's tough because it's not because a microRNA or a protein is upregulated that it is the most functionally effective in vivo. So I think given the number of factors present, I would say, in the soup, it's going to be terribly difficult to dissect out which is or which are the components which are the most effective. And evidence for that comes from the numerous studies about EVs. If you look at these studies, you will see that one study will tell you that this microRNA is the active principle. And another study will tell you that this protein is actually the active principle and so on. So, uh, yes, we, we, we know exactly what is in the, in, in the EVs, but uh, I, I'm not sure that we will really succeed in, you know, fine-tuning the composition to a point that we can say this is a drug because we only have three or four microRNAs or protein. But maybe the industry will be able to do it. Thank you. Really beautiful talk and uh, continued leadership in this area. I had the same question as Josh, but a related question uh, occurred to me just now as I'm standing up here. What about um, engineering the uh, 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 exosomes of uh, the cells, cells that are from which you derive the exosome, engineering them to uh, maybe reduce uh, activation of immunity, maybe uh, MHC knockout, or have you thought about, uh, are you concerned about uh, long-term uh, repeated uh, administrations causing uh, uh, innate immu or rather immune uh, re uh, reaction? Okay, so two things. Uh, that might be a next step, definitely. I think the prerequisite would, would first to be sure <laughs> that the mechanism uh, is through a modulation of immunity. Now, your, the, the other part of your question relates probably to the immunogenicity of repeated administrations. Correct. Right now, we have done these JLP studies with repeated IV administration at doses one log higher 
than the highest dose that the patients could receive. And so far, once again, under JLP condition, there has been absolutely no evidence for toxicity. Mm. We also have extensively mapped the immune profile of the EVs, and basically, they are immunologically neutral. They don't trigger lymphocyte proliferation in vitro. They don't trigger NK degranulation. So we'll see what happens in the patients, because patients are not mice. But so far, we're pretty reassured regarding the immunogenicity or the lack of immunogenicity of these EVs. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so I have one question. Uh, is, uh, this is a super net, uh, latent of the uh, cell culture media derived. So is there any uh, difference among the lot? Any? Is there any lot of difference? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I uh, You know, uh, each time, uh, uh, um, you uh, use, uh, uh, you extracted uh, EV from a uh, supernatant of the cell culture media. But uh, uh, in such case, is there any lot difference? Each time you experiment the same one? Yeah, basically yes. Mm -hmm. if, if the question is about the reproducibility, the, que the, the answer is yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Thank you. So I changed the cap and move on to the presentation of uh, Professor Sagoshima about autophagy. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Keiichi and Jay uh, for including me in this fantastic symposium. So my lab is studying the role of autophagy in heart failure. And uh, today, uh, I would like to focus on, on the role of autophagy in aging, since aging is a major facilitator of uh, cardiovascular disease. And many uh, investigators study the the autophagy in aging, and consensus is that the autophagy decline with aging. And also, there are several uh, systemic uh, gain of autophagy function mouse model, and uh, these models uh, show a lifespan extension. And also, uh, many uh, several organisms, uh, the, there are model of lifespan extension. Uh, most uh, important ones is caloric restriction and mitochondrial stress, and uh, these actually model requires autophagy for uh, inducing lifespan extension. And uh, in collaboration with Guido Chroma, we also did the experiment, and we confirmed that the autophagic flux is in inhibited in aging mice, and that this is a reactivatable by polyamine, but uh, I don't speak about it. And uh, we have recently uh, discussed the what could be the cause of autophagy suppression and uh, maybe uh, anti the oxidative stress and other causes actually suppressed autophagy. And also in collaboration with Bestlebin, uh, we uh, uh, characterized her mice. Uh, this is an autophagy gain of function mice and uh, these mice have lived longer than control mice. And if you study the heart, the aging mice show uh, better cardiac function. So uh, we, we can say that uh, autophagy suppression is important for the aging phenotype in the heart. So what, what, what is the cause of the, the, this uh, cardiac dysfunction uh, by suppression of, uh, uh, suppression of autophagy? So we are focusing on senescence. The senescence is a concept of a proliferating cells, but the increasing lines of evidence, evidence that uh, the telomere DNA damage uh, causes same effect as uh, senescence in proliferating cells. And the most important feature is uh, survivor. Uh, they have survivor advantage. And also uh, they have uh, the uh, secretion uh, of factors which induces aging in surrounding cells. And of course, uh, senescent cells suppress uh, the cell cycle 
But I don't know the significance of this in cardiomyocytes since cardiomyocytes is terminally differentiated. So uh, in order to examine the connection between autophagy suppression and senescence, uh, we use ATG7 knockout mice because uh, these mice uh, completely shut down autophagosome formation. You see the LC32 disappear and the P62 uh, marketry accumulates. So Peyon Zai uh, characterized these mice and uh, we saw uh, the upregulation of many markers of uh, senescence in these mice. And uh, we uh, confirmed that the uh, upregulation of, for example, IL-6 is in cardiomyocyte. And one may say that uh, ATG7 knockout mice show uh, cardiac dysfunction. So uh, senescence induction could be secondary to cardiac dysfunction. So we in injected uh, AAV Cree uh, into these mice and uh, we made a chimeric mice so that the cardiac function is not affected, but the still uh, the GFP plus cell has greater uh, senescence. And also uh, we can reproduce this in cardiomyocyte. So uh, we believe that the effect of senescence is cell autonomous. So uh, we, uh, and also uh, we uh, examined whether uh, this uh, senescence is important for the development of cardiac dysfunction in ATG7 knockout mice. And uh, these mice actually develop uh, cardiac dysfunction. And uh, we uh, treated uh, these mice with a Navitocrax. This is a, a BCL2 inhibitor. And the senescent cell has survival advantage. So uh, if we uh, inhibit the BCL2, uh, senescent cell die uh, before uh, normal cell die. And uh, we found that uh, uh, here, uh, the DNA damage marker is marked to decrease. We believe that the most likely senescent cell could not survive and disappear. And uh, we found that uh, uh, LV dysfunction was normalized. So uh, we believe that uh, in our model, ATG7 knockout mice, uh, uh, senescence is important for, for the development of cardiomyopathy. And since ATG7 knockout is a quite artificial model, so we also use the doxorubicin cardiomyopathy, uh, which, uh, in which uh, many investigators uh, suggested the senescence uh, myocyte is increased. So uh, we uh, treated the, uh, the doxorubicin treated mouse heart, mouse mice with uh, uh, Navitocrax again, and uh, we uh, confirmed that uh, decreases in uh, senescent cell improve uh, cardiac function uh, in doxorubicin mice. And what happened to autophagy? And again, uh, many investigators uh, found that uh, autophagy is suppressed uh, in these mice. And uh, this is an elegant paper by Joe Hill. And uh, he uh, suggested that autophagic flux is inhibited by doxorubicin treatment. And uh, we were able to confirm that uh, same, you know, autophagic flux is suppressed in this model. And uh, we have our, our own uh, autophagy, uh, gain of autophagy function mice. So we treated uh, these mice uh, with uh, doxorubicin and uh, uh, we uh, found that the development of senescence is inhibited and cardiac function is improved. So uh, we uh, have two models and autophagy suppression induces senescence, and uh, that, uh, that causes cardiac dysfunction. And uh, uh, one mechanism we are looking at is uh, a contribution of YAP. And uh, YAP, again, at the ARAB is a, a big fan of the HIPPO pathway, and uh, YAP is a, a nuclear component of the HIPPO pathway, and uh, controls uh, cell proliferation and survival. And uh, our recent uh, uh, JCI paper uh, the level of uh, YAP is controlled by autophagy. This is a selective form of autophagy, and uh, we found that uh, uh, this uh, uh, YAP interacts with the P62. This is the adapter protein which brings the uh, YAP to the autophagosome, and uh, uh, YAP stability is controlled by autophagy. And uh, if you inhibit autophagy, as you see here, YAP accumulates. And uh, this happens in uh, ATG7 knockout mice and also doxorubicin mice. 
and uh, we are able to confirm that not only YAP accumulates, but also YAP is found in the nucleus. And uh, we believe that uh, not only accumulation, but also the presence of uh, DNA damage caused uh, nuclear translocation of a YAP. So the uh, question is whether YAP can do something. So uh, we injected uh, AAB9 uh, 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 YAP into the mouse heart and look at whether uh, uh, gain of YAP function affects some uh, senescence phenotype. And we are able to show uh, this DNA damage markers and also IL-6 expression is increased. And also uh, we uh, uh, conducted the in vitro experiment and uh, we uh, treated cardiomyocyte with a doxorubicin and uh, found that the IL-6 is increased but uh, this increase was inhibited when uh, YAP was downregulated. And, and also uh, IL-6 uh, can induce a senescence in our hands. So uh, we believe that uh, this sequence, uh, uh, doxorubicin upregulates YAP and induces uh, upregulation of factors and that induces senescence. So uh, if uh, this mechanism uh, is true, suppression of YAP uh, should inhibit uh, the senescence and, uh, in cardiac dysfunction. So uh, we uh, uh, basically crossed uh, ATG7 knockout mice with YAP knockout mice, and uh, we are able to show that uh, the, uh, the DNA damage marker decreases, and also IL-6 uh, expression is decreased, and also uh, cardiac function is uh, improved. So uh, we believe that the YAP is involved in uh, survival and also a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, a paracrine mechanism. So uh, we believe that the uh, YAP could be the mediator of senescence in cardiomyocytes. Since uh, YAP is generally a protective mechanism, so we thought that uh, suppressing YAP in every cardiomyocyte may not be necessarily beneficial. So uh, according to the recent publication Cell Metabolism, we uh, basically took the same approach to insert a CRE in an endogenous P6, uh, downstream or endogenous P16 promoter so that uh, we can manipulate gene expression only in uh, senescent cells. And uh, we uh, uh, basically uh, the, uh, made uh, the, uh, crossed the Rosa uh, uh, the, uh, uh, tomato mice with uh, this CRE mice and uh, we uh, basically labeled uh, P16 plus cells with a tomato. And uh, we are able to show that uh, this uh, staining was increased by dox doxorubicin treatment. And also these uh, cells are uh, bigger than uh, other uh, the uh, TD tomato negative cells. And also these cells are often positive uh, IL-6. So we believe that uh, this approach uh, manipulates gene expression only in senescent cells. And uh, we uh, found that the uh, uh, doxorubicin treatment in these mice uh, decreases YAP positive cells and also uh, uh, the DNA ma damage marker positive cells. So we believe that uh, this approach uh, also uh, decreases uh, the senescent cells. And uh, we are able to show that the cardiac dysfunction was normalized and also uh, fibrosis normalized. So we believe that uh, 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 suppressing YAP uh, in a senescent cells is effective way to uh, eliminate senescent cells and improve, uh, prevent uh, uh, the senescence-induced cardiomyopathy. So one uh, big question is the suppression of, of autophagy, uh, why the, uh, the senescent cell become more uh, survival, uh, has more survival advantage and also can secrete factors. And it has been shown that uh, the senescent cells are actually metabolically very active and uh, has to uh, survive even in the presence of a stressful environment. So it has been shown that the their uh, mitochondrial function could be more active than uh, control cells, like a cancer cells, you know. So uh, this is a really puzzling because 
uh, autophagy is a very important uh, cellular quality control mechanism. So a uh, question is how then, how it can happen? So uh, we uh, speculate that somehow a mitochondrial quality control is maintained even in the presence of autophagy suppression. Then uh, the, uh, we have been studying the, the, uh, the connection between autophagy and mitophagy past few years, and uh, we have uh, ample of uh, example in which uh, uh, non-specific autophagy and mitophagy uh, are regulated by different mechanisms. And uh, uh, for example, in doxorubicin uh, treated uh, heart and cardiomyocyte, uh, we found that the autophagic flux, this is a non-specific autophagic flux, is completely inhibited. But I in these mice, mitophagy is still active. So uh, this is puzzling because the mitophagy occurs uh, using conventional autophagy machinery, but uh, somehow non-specific autophagy and mitophagy are regulated by distinct uh, cell mechanisms. And also we have a premature aging mouse model we recently published in uh, Journal of Cardiovascular Aging. And uh, we, uh, we found that uh, in these mice, uh, aging also suppress uh, autophagic flux, but uh, mitophagy is not suppressed. Mitophagy is activated. So how uh, can, can we can explain this? And uh, we uh, published a paper in JCI 2019 when uh, conventional autophagy is suppressed, there's an alternative mechanism to compensate the mitophagy. And mitophagy is a such an important mechanism, so it probably makes sense that the cell has a backup mechanism to supplement uh, lack of mitophagy. And that this mitophagy doesn't require conventional ATG7 conjugation system, but uh, it has uh, different system so that uh, damaged mitochondria can be sequestrated and degraded through a lysosome. So uh, we believe that uh, even in the presence of convention, lack of conventional autophagy, mitophagy can be activated. And uh, lucky we have a, a RAB9 S179A mice in which alternative mitophagy is suppressed but the conventional autophagy is not affected. So uh, we treated uh, these mice with uh, doxorubicin, and uh, we are able to show that uh, DNA damage marker is decreased and cardiac function is improved. And the same thing happens in uh, cells, and uh, uh, we are able to show uh, if you suppress this alternative mitophagy, uh, the uh, basically uh, senescent cell cannot survive, and, and then this is probably beneficial for, for the heart. And uh, what What's the connection between YAP and alternative mitophagy? And uh, we, uh, we are able to show that the YAP can increase mitophagy. Uh, we have a mitochema specific uh, indicator of a mitophagy, and the YAP has the ability to stimulate mitophagy. And also, uh, we have recently shown that uh, TFE3, it's a transcription factor regulating uh, lysosomal biogenesis and autophagy, plays an important role in mediating alternative mitophagy, and uh, we found recently found that, that this YAP uh, interact with a TF, TFE, TFE3. So although uh, we still are working on this, but uh, we uh, believe that activation of YAP not only uh, induces survival of cardiomyocyte, but also uh, stimulate alternative mitophagy, and that allows uh, induction of secretion of factors, and that induces uh, cardiac aging. So to summarize my talk, I started that uh, from uh, suppression of autophagy is important for the aging, and uh, we propose that that is uh, mediated by senes induction of senescence, and uh, we believe that the accumulation of YAP plus most likely DNA damage marker activate YAP, and that allows survival of cardiomyocyte and also uh, induction of uh, uh, the uh, SASP and IL-6 and other factors are important in induction of the senescence. So uh, uh, I'd like to discuss a few things. One is that, of course, uh, aging uh, is induced by cell autonomous mechanism, but we believe that the, uh, this in the heart, paracrine mechanism is also important. 
And uh, we have to, uh, we believe that the targeting senescent cells is important and that to know uh, the property of senescent cells is important and that we believe that, that uh, the senescent cell have survival advantage and also requires high energy for, for senes uh, SASP. And so in that sense, uh, the targeting YAP uh, is very effective because it can kill uh, cardiom the senescent cells and also prevent SASP. So uh, with that, I, I like to conclude my talk by introducing my fellows. And uh, this work is done by Pei Yon Zai, uh, who is a senior fellow uh, in my lab. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Professor Chiaka. Th thank you very much, very, very, very nice work. I think this is a question that you, you, you must receive often. How do you reconcile this uh, pro-hypertrophic and pro-senescent uh, uh, role of YAP with the role of YAP in regeneration and proliferation? Yeah, so uh, I think we have to distinguish uh, the senescent cells and ordinary cells. So uh, senescent cell uh, acquire the very specific, uh, you know, the feature so that uh, it act as a bad, bad cells, but uh, you know we have to preserve YAP function in non senescent cells. So uh, I think it's you know that that's why I try to uh, induce uh, suppress YAP only in senescent cells. And I completely agree that the YAP yeah. in ordinary cells are good, but the YAP in senescent cells <laughs> is not necessary. But but do you, do you believe that this uh, mechanism uh, from from uh, endothelial cells by which YAP is cytoplasmic, uh, its uh, transfer is regulated by lack of phosphorylation, so on and so forth, also apply to this uh, specific role in senescence? Mm. So there is the shuttling of YAP? Yeah, so uh, the, I don't know the, the role of YAP in uh, endothelial cells, but uh, my colleague Dominic Derry has a serotype specific role of YAP, and particularly uh, inflammatory cells, uh, you know, YAP is certainly uh, important for secretion of uh, cytokines. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know much about the role of YAP in endothelial cells. I will, I will say, I will, sorry, I said endothelia, but it was epithelial cells, so in cancer cells. Mm. So, sorry, that, that also could be a cell right, type right, specific right. role. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Um, so I, I'm wondering the, uh, the what determine the senescent cells? So it looks like the senescent cells are still minor fraction of cardiomyocyte. So did that uh, stochastically determine the who become the senescent and who be who's not? Yeah, most likely local environment. Uh, you know, the I don't know. Uh, that's why I, I use the doxorubicin. Uh, that actually in, in induce very high number of senescent cells. So uh, in uh, real aging condition, uh, which distinguish senescence, senescent cells and normal cells, I, I, I need to find out. It's most likely something local environment. Thank you. Jun, congratulations. So the YAP test signaling pathway, YAP phosphorylation will make the YAP leave the cell. Yes. Will inhibit the phosphorylation, make an internalization of the exactly. YAP in the nuclear to promote the um, proliferation and act on the synthesis cell. So did you look at the phosphorylation? Uh, how do you overexpress the YAP and then prevent phosphorylation? Yeah. That's a little complicated. So we, uh, you raised a good point. And uh, we are now looking at the phosphorylation. And, and uh, the literature, we have not uh, got the conclusive evidence yet, but according to the literature, uh, for example, ATM, DNA damage kinase, uh, can induce YAP, nuclear translocation of YAP. So are we looking at the YAP phosphorylation and what identified <laughs> upstream kinase is very important, but I don't have. So can we simply think it's a mass action if you overexpress the flux of uh, flux of internalization yeah. increase? So uh, my uh, CTNT, I, I don't use the, the 
the uh, S, uh, for, for example, the uh, constitutive active YAP, so uh, mass action, that, that's true. But uh, in, in general, uh, in cardiomyocytes, if you overexpress YAP, uh, it can do the same, same function as the uh, phosphorylation resistant YAP. But uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very, thank much. You very much. And I think. Move on to uh, the presentation by Professor Arde Halley on the role of exokinase 1 mitochondrial binding and exosamine biosynthesis pathway in the development of HPAC. Great. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Jay and Dr. Fukuda for inviting me to this uh, interesting and uh, wonderful conference. Today I'm going to tell you about the fascinating uh, family of uh, enzymes and that's hexokinases. And you know, with hexokinases, I'm sure you all know that they phosphorylate glucose as they get into the cell. But there are, um, and um, you know, there are five mammalian hexokinases. And what has really, uh, fa you know, what's interesting about these enzymes is that uh, uh, even though only you need 50 kilodalton enzyme to phosphorylate glucose, um, there are, these ma mammalian hexokinases have evolved and they have become more uh, complex, uh, complex and complicated compared to the primitive uh, hexokinases that are just 50 kilodalton to phosphorylate, uh, that is required for glucose phosphorylation. So this evolution of hexokinases has really um, fascinated me over the past few years. And just to show you uh, what we know about the evolution of these hexokinases, and just going back, I want to mention that my PhD was on uh, hexokinase 2, and when I started my lab, I tried to get away from these enzymes, but you know they were so fascinating that I came back to them and studied the evolution of these enzymes. So this is what we have proposed about the evolution of hexokinases, that they came from a primitive uh, hexokinase, a yeast-like uh, hexokinase, which was 50 kilodaltons in size. And as these enzymes evolved, uh, they uh, duplicated, and uh, now most of the mammalian hexokinases are 100 kilodaltons in size. But glucokinase, which is hexokinase 4, is still 50 kilodalton in size. And what happened was that after the evolution, after these enzymes evolved, the enzymatic activity was retained in one uh, in some in the in some of the uh, uh, hexokinases in both halves, and in others the enzymatic activity was uh, lost in the N-terminal domain of, or, or N-terminal half of the enzyme. In addition to that, hexokinase 1 and hexokinase 2 also obtain this very hydrophobic sequence at their very N-terminus that allows them to bind to the mitochondria. So this is basically the structure of uh, mammalian hexokinases. There are five of them, and hexokinase 1 has only enzymatic activity in the C-terminal half, which is shown in red. Hexokinase 2 has enzymatic activity in both halves, and both of these enzymes are capable of binding to the mitochondria. Hexokinase 3 and hexokinase 5 have enzymatic activity only in the C half, Hexokinase 3 cannot bind to the mitochondria, hexokinase 5 can, and glucokinase, which is basically the enzyme that is expressed in the pancreatic uh, uh, beta cells and also in, in, uh, in the liver, is only 50 kilodalton, kilo similar to the uh, hexokinases that yeast and bacteria express. So a very primitive form of the hexokinase is present in, in the uh, uh, pancreatic cells and also liver cells. So the question is that why do these hexokinases bind to the mitochondria? And a lot of groups, including our groups, used overexpression studies to overexpress the full length and also the truncated form of hexokinases that don't bind to the mitochondria. And two uh, hypotheses have been proposed. One is that when it is bound to the mitochondria, it has prefer preferential access to the ATP that is generated in, in the mitochondria and also to push ADP back into the mitochondria, and also for protection against cell death. And this is ba basically de depicted in this slide that when hexokinases are bound to the mitochondria, there is more cell survival because mitochondrial permeability transition pore is closed. And when it, they're in the cytoplasm, there is more uh, apoptosis because MPTP is open. But that was not really satisfying, and to really understand why these hexokinases bind to the mitochondria, we made mouse models that lack this mitochondrial binding domain of both hexokinase 1 and hexokinase 2. With hexokinase 1, when we made these mice, the mice are perfectly normal. We didn't get any problems with these mice. It has been almost eight years we are trying to get hexokinase 2 mice that lack this mitochondrial binding domain, and we haven't been able to get any. 
So it appears that if you remove this mitochondrial binding domain in hexokinase 2, it's embryonically lethal. And now we are doing, uh, we are trying to put, put log P sequences to delete this sequence in, the, in a tissue specific manner. So with this, uh, I'm just gonna focus on hexokinase 1 in, the, uh, in this talk. And we have studied these uh, uh, mice in two different um, cell types, macrophages and endothelial cells. Today I'm gonna focus on endothelial cells. Let me just briefly tell you about macrophages. This was published last year and uh, was done by a very bright MD-PhD student in the lab, uh, Adam DeJesus. So basically what he showed was that there was an increase, you know, in this uh, slide he basically showed that there is a reduction in mitochondrial binding domain when you remove uh, I'm sorry, mitochondrial binding of hexokinase 1 when you remove the mitochondrial binding domain. Glucose phosphorylation is not effective, which is expected. Again, the enzymatic function is retained. It's just what we are manipulating is the binding to the mitochondria. But what we saw was that there was a change in glycolysis that was measured indirectly by ECAR. And when he did metabolomics, he re realized that there is a defect or there is a stop or blockage at the gap DH step. Everything about GAPDH dh was upregulated. Everything downstream of GAPDH dh was down, uh, downregulated, or meaning that the, um, the metabolites were lower downstream of GAPDH. dh And then he showed that this correlated with the inflammatory function of macrophages. So when the, there was, uh, in our delta E1, HK1, that's what we call these mice, when they were uh, stimulated, when the macrophages were stimulated with LPS, there was a significant increase in the amount of inflammatory cells. And when we challenged these mice with LPS, there was more mortality in these mice, meaning that they have a hyperinflammatory function because, of, because their macrophages are more inflammatory. To understand the mechanism uh, more, uh, you know, in more detail, he inhibited pentose phosphate pathway, and he showed that this increase in inflammatory cytokines that are produced in the macrophages of these mice are completely back to normal when the pentose phosphate pathway is inhibited, which is basically it's suggesting that this, path, this increase in, inf uh, in infl inflammatory cytokine production is dependent on the increase in the pentose phosphate pathway. So this is basically the summary of what he found was that there is a block at the level of gap DH, and as a result, sorry, as a result, there is more uh, shuttling of glucose into the pentose phosphate pathway. And as you know, for to produce cytokines in inflammatory cells, you need to make RNA molecule. And to make RNA molecule, you need nucleotides. And that's why macrophages are very dependent on the pentose phosphate pathway. So that's why the inhibition of GAPDH causes an increase in, sh uh, sh in uh, 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 shuttling of the intermediates into the pentose phosphate pathway. So what I've shown you so far is that if you find a way to push hexokinase into the cytoplasm, there is an inhibition of GAPDH, which increases pentose phosphate pathway, and that causes an increase in cytokine production. The next question is that why does dislocation of hexokinase from the mitochondria have an effect on GAPDH? I'm not gonna go over uh, that in detail, but what he showed, what Adam showed, was that when hexokinase one is in the cytoplasm, it binds to this complex called S1, A, S100 A889. Many of you may not know about this complex. It's mostly expressed in inflammatory cells, and what it does is that it binds to INOS and causes activation of INOS, and INOS causes nitrosylation of GAPDH, which is a mechanism to inhibit GAPDH, and as a result, there is an increase in pentose phosphate pathway when hexokinase 1 is in the cytoplasm. So this was quite surprising to us because up to this point, everybody was claiming that hexokinase is bind to the mitochondria to do something. But this, what we found was that hexokinases are actually in the cytoplasm to do something. This was more of a gain of function when they go to the cytoplasm versus the, when they're in the mitochondria. In the mitochondria, binding to the mitochondria is where they should be. But when they translocate into the cytoplasm, then they have an effect on the uh, macrophage uh, cytokine production. And you may be asking, does it happen in nature? I'm not gonna go into detail, but we included that in the paper that this does happen with aging, with diabetes, with a lot of different processes, and including with infection, inflammation, that hexokinase goes to the cytoplasm. So this is a dynamic process of hexokinase shuttling from the mitochondria to the cytoplasm. So as we were doing this study, uh, this study is a postdoc in the lab, uh, um, uh, Yuki uh, 
uh, uh, <coughs> Tatekoshi in the lab, he came to me and he said he wanted to study the hearts of these mice. And uh, my response was that, well, there is no phenotype in these mice. But he told me that there was uh, the mice, as, he, as they age, they display this phenotype that is more consistent with diastolic dysfunction. So there is a lot of information here, but he basically showed that E to E prime ratio is significantly increased. E to A ratio is uh, significantly increased, increased. Left atrial area is increased. There is more fibrosis, and also there is less uh, capillary density in these mice. And this is consistent with HEFPEP. And uh, you know, one problem we have that you know, with this uh, the uh, high fat diet with L name that Joe Hill has uh, developed, which is a really nice model, and I'm going to talk about that. But those mice get obese. And uh, so their uh, exercise capacity decreases because of their obesity. And of course, they showed in the paper that high fat diet and obesity wasn't sufficient for the reduction in exercise tolerance. But these mice are not obese. Regardless, as they age, they still are ca not capable of running as well as uh, wild type mice. So with that, he also showed that these mice develop HEFPEF at an earlier age in response to high fat diet. So by just high fat diet, they get uh, the phenotype of HEFPEF uh, showing again that E to A, E prime ratio is significantly increased per percent of fibrosis. And also some of the markers of HEFPEF are increased. So with that, I was still not convinced because hexokinase one is not mostly expressed in cardiomyocytes. Uh, the major isoform of hexokinase that is expressed in cardiomyocytes is hexokinase 2. So I told him that, you know, I told Yuki, I'm still not convinced that this phenotype is because of the hexokinase 1 dislocation from the mitochondria. So with this single analysis of single cell RNA seq, and it be showed that in the heart, uh, the uh, uh, cell type that expresses hexokinase 1 at very high level is endothelial cells. This is something we knew uh, initially, again, but this was confirmed by single cell RNA seq. And this was basically unique to hexokinases and maybe with uh, phosphofructokinase. But the rest of the enzymes are basically over, uh, expressed uh, at similar levels in different cell types in, in, in the heart, uh, enzymes involved in glycolysis. And we also showed by uh, doing uh, you know, RNA analysis, protein analysis, and also immunohistochemistry that hexokinase one is mostly expressed in endothelial cells. So we wanted to focus on uh, hexokinase 1 in the endothelial cells as the likely uh, mechanism for the phenotype we are seeing in these mice, uh, which is basically diastolic dysfunction and also HEFPEF. So the first thing we did, we uh, re uh, recapitulated um, uh, Joe Hill's model with high fat diet and L name, and we showed that there is an increase, uh, you know, but we got the same phenotype that uh, was reported in their paper, but we didn't see a change in hexokinase 1 levels in these hearts. So then uh, Yuki, Yuki looked at the binding of hexokinase 1 to the mitochondria, and he showed there was a significant dislocation of hexokinase 1 to the cytoplasm in the, in the HEFPEF model. So hexokinase 1, again, this has been shown that hexokinases dislocate from the mitochondria in various diseases. So in HEFPEF, there is this tendency for hexokinase 1 to get uh, dislocated from the mitochondria. Now, since we had this model of hexokinase 1 not binding to the mitochondria, we looked that their microvascular density, which was significantly decreased, the number of mi microvasculature, also percent area of microvasculature. And we showed that there is a defect in angiogenesis of this microvasculature of, uh, from these mice in, uh, you know, when you isolate them and you grow them in vitro, various mo uh, markers of uh, angiogenesis, including uh, number of junctions, uh, number of uh, segments, uh, number of meshes, and also uh, branching were significantly reduced in these mice and also cell migration. So, so far, again, in the setting of HEFPEF, we show that hexokinase 1 is dislocated from the mitochondria. But if you find a way to dislocate hexokinase from uh, the mitochondria, like what we have in our mice, there is also a reduction in uh, angiogenesis, and there is a, uh, an increase in the HEFPEF phenotype. The next question is that why does hexokinase 1 from the mitochondria, dislocation from the mitochondria have an effect on angiogenesis. So for that, we did metabolomics. And again, what we saw was that there was an increase in pentose phosphate pathway, similar to what we saw in, uh, sorry, what we saw in, uh, in macrophages. But in, the, in endothelial cells, we also saw that there was a decrease in the elements or in the uh, intermediates in hexosamine biosynthesis pathway. 
So if you're not familiar with the exosamine biosynthesis pathway, this is a, a pathway that starts with fructose 6-phosphate. So this is the intermediate below glucose 6-phosphate. And, and this pathway basically uh, cause, increases protein glycosylation. And there are different forms of protein glycosylation. The major form is N-glycosylation and also protein oglycnaculation. So again, there is a reduction in uh, steady state metabolomics in the exosamine biosynthesis pathway, but there was no change in flux uh, through that pathway. So we said there must be an increase in either protein oglycnaculation or, or protein glycosylation as a result of uh, hexokinase 1 dislocation from the mitochondria. We focused first on the protein uh, glycosylation, and if anything, it was actually reduced. So it was an increase. So as a result, we focused on protein O uh, glycnaculation, and we saw that there was a significant increase in protein O glycnaculation because of hexokinase 1 dislocation from the mitochondria. We have done a, a, a lot of studies trying to figure out what exactly, why exactly this happens. And we have evidence that when hexokinase 1 is in the cytoplasm, it is in close proximity to OGT, which is the uh, key enzyme in protein oglycnaculation. And this proximity, we think, has an effect on the activity of uh, OGT. So the next thing we wanted to do was to see if we use OGT inhibitors, we can reverse this phenotype. In vitro, we were able to show that, and there was a significant reversal in the, in the uh, angiogenesis in the endothelial cells from these mice when we used uh, an OGT inhibitor. But we also wanted to do this in vivo. Because as you know, there is a very, uh, you know, Joe is uh, going to probably talk about that. I don't know if he's going to talk about that today, but he has said it several times that we have so many uh, uh, so many, uh, you know, uh, uh, drug treatment for HFPREF, but our uh, treatment for HFPREF is very limited. I don't know if, uh, you know, uh, physicians in the room agree with me, but I basically think as a cardiologist that the best treatment for HFPREF is exercise. I try to encourage all my patients to uh, to uh, go to cardiac rehab because that's probably the most effective treatment for HFPEF. Aldactone maybe works, but you know, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, is another treatment, a potential treatment. So we wanted to see if we can target this oglycnaculation pathway in vivo as a potential treatment. And for that, we of course uh, took two different approaches. One is the genetic approach by overexpressing the reverse enzyme, which is OGA. And also what we wanted to come up with a pharmacological approach for, for inhibition of OGT. First, let me tell you about the genetic approach, which was overexpression of OGA to counteract the, uh, you know, the hyperactivation of OGT in our mice. And what we did, we got a mouse that overexpresses OGA specifically in endothelial cells. And this was doxorubicin uh, dependent. With doxorubicin, there is an increase in OGA OGA expression in, uh, in these mice. And uh, so we subjected these mice to high fat diet and L name. And what we saw was that all the markers of uh, HFPEF is completely reversed with, uh, tre with treatment with doxycycline, which induces the expression of OGA in the endothelial cells of these mice. Again, I'm not going to go over all these details, but we did extensive studies. The whole, you know, the phenotype is almost completely reversed. So for the pharmacological approach, there are probably 10 to 15 OGT inhibitors that are available. But none of them can be used in vivo because they are, uh, they, they, for various reasons, you know, they cannot get, uh, they cannot be used in mice. There was a paper that was published in 2019 in a chem chemistry journal where they showed uh, a new uh, compo compound called 5S uh, uh, hex that can be used in, vi in vivo. And they had actually done extensive studies on, on, this, chem on this chemical. Uh, this is a very difficult chemical to make. Uh, it costs us about uh, 15 to 16,000 just to get a, s a small amount of this uh, chemical for our studies uh, from a company in China that uh, requires this, uh, making this chemical requires 10 enzyme, 10 chemical reaction to get, to get this to this point. But we got enough for our analysis and we showed that there is a, a significant reduction in protein and glycosylate, I'm sorry, oglycnaculation within the first uh, 48 hours after it is injected. So we injected mice every two days with this chemical, and we subjected them to a high-fat diet plus L-name. And again, all the markers of uh, HFPEF were completely reversed by uh, using this chemical in these mice. And we have used uh, concentration-dependent, different concentrations of this chemical, and they, they, this chemical is very effective in reducing uh, HFPEF. 
So just to summarize what I've shown you right now is that hexokinase one, when it is bound to the mitochondria, it's uh, in endothelial cells, it, uh, 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 some of this glucose, of course, goes through, gly uh, uh, through glycolysis, but some of that glucose also goes through the hexosamine biosynthesis pathway. But that glucose is mostly, when it goes through hexosamine biosynthesis pathway, that is used for uh, protein and glycosylation, for protein glycosylation, which is a really kind of normal process for he hexosamine biosynthesis pathway in our body. But when hexokinase 1 is in the cytoplasm, it pushes this hexosamine biosynthesis pathway towards oglycnaculation, which is a pathological process, and that has an effect on angiogenic uh, uh, proteins, and that causes a reduction in uh, endothelial cell function, causes endothelial cell dysfunction and angiogenesis, and uh, that leads to uh, uh, HFPEF. Now, so what we are proposing that is the primary defect in HFPEF is actually a defect in angiogenesis and in endothelial cell function, which is something we, we, we believe is, and there is evidence for it, that one of the precursors, one of the first events that happens in the, in the patients and also in mice with HFPEF is due to endothelial cell dysfunction. And this also makes sense because one of the major uh, uh, risk factors for HFPEF is diabetes. And we know that in uh, uh, diabetes, there is an increase in protein oglycnaculation. So protein oglycnaculation being responsible for, for the pathogenesis of uh, HFPEF makes sense because that's, again, uh, uh, associated with one of the risk factors for diabetes. This is my last slide. I just want to tell you that the first enzyme in glucose metabolism is not just there to phosphorylate glucose. That's why they, these enzymes have really fascinated me because they are so complicated. They have like two halves uh, that are in the same enzyme. They're in the same enzyme, you have two uh, portions of the enzyme that are produced, and now we are actually deleting each portion in mice. We, are ge we have generated mice that lack each portion, but they also bind to the mitochondria. And if they don't bind, if you find a way to dislocate them from the mitochondria, you would have effects at least on macrophages. We showed that it causes macrophages become more inflammatory. In endothelial cells, we showed that this dislocation cause, has an effect on angiogenesis and also on HFPEF. And uh, one of the postdocs in my lab is also studying it in CD8 positive T cells. And this actually has turned out to be really fascinating in that interferon gamma production is reduced because of less substrate entry into the mitochondria. So uh, finally, uh, uh, we are trying to see what exactly is the mechanism for this dislocation. There are some mechanisms that have been proposed. Now we are doing a CRISPR screen to identify the pathway that is involved in this process. So with that, I want to thank the members of my lab and also uh, uh, um, you know, uh, funding organizations. And uh, thank you so much. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We have time for just one question. Okay, so maybe I, you have a question? So please, quick question and quick answer, because yes. we are running out of time. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I was wondering, so some papers have actually shown that oglycnaculation may be protective in heart failure. For example, there's um, some papers from Johannes Back showing that oglycnaculation of HDAX can be protective in heart failure. So can you comment on that? Yeah, so from what most, you know, most papers have shown, oglycnaculation actually has detrimental effects on proteins. So that's not, and oglycnaculation is generally associated with, uh, with diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, diabetes increases in prote protein oglycnaculation. Now, I believe that glycosylation would be, you know, would have more positive effect. But oglycnaculation, I think generally is accepted to have detrimental effects on protein function at least ma the majority of proteins, but whether or not it has an, uh, uh, you know, protective effects on uh, HDAX, I don't know. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we are moving back to the EV area with a presentation by Professor Gustafsson, secretion of mitochondria in extracellular vesicles as an alternative quality control pathway in the heart. Slightly different, I think, but anyway, the vesicles are still there. 
Okay, so thank you everyone. And I also want to take a moment to thank Jay and Dr. Fukuda for inviting me to speak here today. It's been a wonderful program and thank you all the diehards for sticking around the last day. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Oh, there we go. So, so in my lab, we're interested in mitochondria and in particularly in mitochondrial quality control pathways because as you all know, the cardiac myocytes, uh, they have a lot of mitochondria that are responsible for generating the majority of the ATP that's uh, used to sustain contraction and other functions. Unfortunately, when the mitochondria become dysfunctional or damaged or age, they can turn into pro-death organelles and become harmful to the cell. Um, so, to deal, so it's really important for post-mitotic cells, such as a cardiac myocyte or a neuron, to eliminate these mitochondria before they activate cell death. And this is particularly true in cases where you only have a few damaged mitochondria and it's really not necessary for the cell to undergo cell death. Uh, so to deal with the problem of mitochondrial damage, the cells have evolved various levels of mitochondrial quality control pathways that functions both at the protein level as well as the organelle level. So the first thing the cell is going to do is try to repair the mitochondrion at the protein level uh, because that's the most cost effective um, for the cell. But then if there's just too much damage to the mitochondrion, then as a last resort, it's going to eliminate the entire organelle. But if you, of course, if you eliminate the mitochondrion, it's going to have to be replaced. Um, so, um, so there are actually multiple pathways, and June Sadashima talked a little bit about this in his talk. There are multiple pathways in the cells that can uh, uh, eliminate mitochondria. We have the traditional uh, and non-canonical autophagy pathways, and uh, a lot of studies have focused on this pathway where you have a phagophore membrane that forms and then sequesters the mitochondria into a double membrane structure that then delivers the cargo to the lysosome for degradation. Uh, the endosomal pathway can also participate in this process where you have instead engulfment of the mitochondria into uh, endosomes, but ultimately you get delivery to the lysosome. We have a much less well characterized process that's called microautophagy that involves engul uh, engulfment of mitochondria directly into the lysosome. But what you can appreciate is that what they all have in common is that they, uh, these degradation pathways all converge at the level of the lysosome, which tells you that the lysosome serves a pretty important function in the cell. So we pose the question, so how do the cells deal with this functional mitochondria when lysosomal uh, function is compromised, and this can happen in certain genetic diseases where you have mutations in, in proteins that are critical for lysosomal function, uh, when you have certain ca cancer therapeutics also accumulate in lysosomes and disrupt it, and lysosomal function also declines with age. So we thought that there must be an alternative mechanism that can potentially compensate for this reduced lysosomal or impaired lysosomal function. Um, so as I mentioned, you can engulf the mitochondria in an autophagosome or they end up in a late endosome and normally they deliver the cargo to the lysosome. So if this is, um, pathway is disrupted, we hypothesize that instead of, uh, fu if this fusion step is impaired, then we believe that everything ends up in the late endosome and then this membrane, uh, this vesicle in then is going to be redirected and fused with the plasma membrane and instead you're going to get secretion of the cargo into the extracellular space and this is uh, also the well-known characterized uh, release of exosomes or as we call them now small ED. So we believe that mitochondria can also take a similar pathway um, and be secreted. So to investigate this, we just started out looking at a cell culture model where we used cultured mouse embryonic fibroblast, and then we collected uh, ED secreted into the conditioned media. Uh, we collected the media over 48 hours, and we, uh, and we did a number of uh, different differ differential centrifugations where we eventually uh, isolated the large ED pellet. And then we did a higher spin and we isolated the small EV or exosome pellet and we ran out these fractions on a Western blot and looked for markers of uh, uh, EVs. Um, and uh, as you can see in the first experiment, we just took these mouse embryonic fibroblasts and we treated them with baflomycin uh, or vehicles. Baflomycin inhibits um, 
uh, lysosomal acidification, so you're disrupting its function. And then we just collected the conditioned media over 48 hours, and then we analyzed uh, what uh, the, you know, the, the cargo is, as well as the markers. Uh, in this large EV fraction, and you can see here, if you focus on the large EV fraction, in cells that were tr treated with baflomycin, we have an increased level of EV markers, Alex, TSG-101, and CD-81 um, in the large EV fraction, as well as two mo different mitochondrial proteins, TIM-23 and TOM-20. They are in the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes, respectively. We also saw an increase in small EVs, but for the rest of the talk, I am gonna focus on the large EVs because we believe we were isolating were um, intact vesicles uh, containing these EV markers as well as containing intact mitochondria. So uh, um, then we also wanted to see, is this occurring in the, in the mouse heart as well? So we developed a pro protocol where we were able to isolate the EVs from the cardiac tissue. So we harvested the heart and we did an enzymatic digestion to separate the cells and release the EVs. And then we did a series of filtration and centrifugation steps. And then at the end, we did our either our differential centrifugation protocol to isolate the smaller or large EVs, or we used a more a different protocol where we're using antibodies to cell surface markers towards these EV, and then we analyze them by, usually by Western blotting. And in this experiment, what we did, we injected mice with chloroquine or vehicles. So chloroquine functions similar to baflomycin in that it inhibits uh, lysosomal function and acidification. And then we isolated the heart tissues and uh, the EVs. And as you can see here, uh, if you look in the large EV fraction, when we looked for markers, we saw an increase in CD81 positive vesicles as well as TIM23 in these uh, vesicles. We've also done a lot of different analysis, you know, by, uh, we've done, um, uh, by, okay, we've done a lot of different assays. Anyway, so, um, so the next step, even though we did see mitochondria in these large EVs, uh, it didn't really tell us exactly where the mitochondria were coming from because there are a lot of different cell types in the heart, so we just knew that the EVs had mitochondria. Uh, but to confirm that it was in fact coming from the cardiac myocytes, we developed a different mouse model uh, where we generate cardiac-specific mitodendratrine mice. So basically these mice, ha they express the, the fluorescent mitodendratrine uh, protein only in the cardiac myocytes. Um, so we can use this for a specific marker to see where is cardiac mitochondria ending up. Then we took these mice and again we injected them with vehicle or chloroquine and we isolated the large EVs and analyzed these fractions by western blotting. And you can see here in the, the mice that were injected again with chloroquine, we have an increase in the large EV fraction, uh, CD81, as well as TIM23, and we're also getting an increase in the mitodendra 2 protein, confirming it that at least a, major, uh, a major portion of the mitochondria that we're isolating in these EVs are in fact coming from the cardiac myocytes. So then we were interested in the mechanism that regulates the release of uh, the large and small EV in cells. As I mentioned, these uh, late endosome or multivesicular bodies, normally they fuse with the lysosome for degradation of the cargo, or they can be redirected to the plasma membrane for secretion of cargo. So the question we posed, well, what dictates whether or not this vesicle is gonna go to the lysosome for fusion, or whether or not it's gonna fuse with the plasma membrane? Uh, so we decided to focus on a protein called RAB7. So this is a small uh, GTPase, and th this is a huge family of proteins that are involved in regulating trafficking, and especially endosomal and uh, autophagy trafficking. Um, so the RAB7 in specifically is involved in regulating trafficking of late endosome and a blade endosome, but it also plays an important role in the autophagy pathway where it's important in uh, mediating the fusion between the late endosome or even the autophagosome with the lysosome. Uh, this RAB7 protein cycles between an active GTP-bound state or an inactive GD-bound sta uh, GD state. Uh, so we asked the question, well, maybe RAB7 is one of the regulators of this trafficking step. So if you inactivate or delete RAB7, then this vesicle is going to be redirected to the plasma membrane instead because it can no longer fuse with the lysosome. 
So uh, we went back to our cell culture model where we uh, used uh, RAB7 deficient mouse embryonic fibroblast and we just compared the level of EV secretion at baseline. So there was no treatment at all in, under these conditions. So again, we just cultured the cells for 48 hours, collected the conditioned media, and then we isolated the large and the small EV fractions. And as you can see here, in the RAB7 deficient cells, just at baseline, we're, we're seeing an increased secretion of large and small EVs. Uh, there, there's more TSU 101, Alex, and CD81, and these vesicles are also positive for mitochondrial proteins, suggesting that if you, you lose RAB7 in the cells, now you're increasing the secretion of e large EVs e containing mitochondria even at baseline. So we also did some electron microscopy studies to look at the morphology and content of these EVs. And you can see this is just on top row here. It's a negative stain, which basically just shows you the morphology of the EVs. You can see that the large EVs are, are very large and spherical. And then we have the much smaller exo exosomes or small EVs. Uh, when we do the, the transmission and electron microscopy, we can actually sit, look at some of the cargo in these, uh, in these vesicles. And as you can see, these are some uh, mi intact mitochondria inside of these large EVs that look like they're in pretty bad shape. Uh, but it confirmed that these are in fact containing uh, intact mitochondria. We also did some proteomics analysis of the, of the large EVs, and this is just comparing the large EVs that we isolated from wild type and RAB7 deficient cells. And you can see from this volcano plot that the RAB7, the, the EVs that we uh, isolated from the RAB7 deficient cells are enriched in many mitochondrial proteins. And I also want to mention that they don't just contain mitochondrial proteins, they do also have ER proteins, so it's not specific for mitochondria alone. Uh, when we do the GO analysis, um, we, ca we can see that they are enriched in uh, organelles, various organelle components, and the biological processes tells us that these are proteins involved in regulating uh, metabolic processes, again, confirming that mitochondria are ending up in these large EVs. So then we wanted to see, uh, go to uh, an in vivo model to see what, what is, is RAB7 also important in regulating EV secretion in the heart. Uh, so we generated cardiac specific RAB7 deficient mice uh, by crossing floxed RAB7 mice with the alpha MHC mercury mer transgenic mice. And then we when these mice reached adulthood, we injected them with five do doses of tamoxifen to initiate deletion of the gene. And then uh, the 28 days after initiating the gene deletion, we did our uh, analysis. And when we looked at cardiac function, uh, we didn't really see a, a significant effect uh, on, on contractility. So it looked like if you delete RAB7 in the heart, um, the, the, mice, the heart is actually tolerating the loss of RAB7 pretty well. Uh, we are seeing some cardiac hypertrophies developing uh, at this time point, so there is some effect of the loss of RAB7, but when we did the H&E staining as well as Mason trichrome stain of these heart sections, it told us that structurally they look normal and we didn't really see an increase in fibrosis. So overall, these hearts are pretty healthy. So what about EV release? So we uh, took the hearts at this time point and we isolated the, the large EV fraction and did our Western blot analysis and we can see here uh, that they are enriched. They seem to be secreting more CD81 positive vesicles <coughs> and again containing mitochondrial proteins. Uh, we did another assay to confirm that there, we in fact have intact mitochondria where we look at mitochondrial DNA content so we know it's not just proteins, we're actually getting uh, mitochondrial DNA inside of these EVs and you can see that not only do we have it in, in all large EVs but it, we're seeing an increase in the e large EVs that were released from the RAB7 deficient mice. So the question then became, well, so the heart clearly is secreting more large EVs containing mitochondria uh, at baseline. So what happens to these EVs? So we never really saw an increase in the large EVs circulating in the plasma. And this was actually quite surprising because that's kind of where I had expected that they would end up. Um, so we thought, well, maybe there are resident macrophages that will uh, take up the garbage that's released from these cells. And uh, so we did a staining just for CD68 and looked at um, 
the level of macrophages at baseline in the RAB7 deficient hearts, and you can see that we do have an increase in the, the number of macrophages in the hearts just at baseline. Uh, we've confirmed this with some facts analysis too. Um, and then we uh, generated uh, a RAB7 uh, conditional knockout, so this is mercury mer mice again, and we crossed them with the mitodendra 2 mice, so again to label all of the cardiac mitochondria, and then we did some uh, 3D rendering experiments just to co confirm that the mitochondria are ending up in the mi uh, macrophages, and what you're seeing, this red dot right here is actually uh, a macrophage stained with uh, CD68, and here's the 3D rendering uh, that we did just to confirm that there are mitochondria, green mitochondrial fragments inside of this macrophage. I have a movie, let's see if it's playing. It hasn't <laughs> before, so uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, it's playing. Uh, so it's just kind of what you're already seeing, but it looks cooler. So you can see the mitochondria inside of this macrophage right there, so. So we're, so we're very confident that these, uh, uh, or the mitochondria at least, that's secreted by the cells are indeed ending up in cardiac macrophages. Okay, so finally, we wanted to you know, put some clinical relevance to our findings, uh, and as I mentioned, there are diseases that are associated with lysosomal defects, and we decided to uh, focus on Dannon's disease because Dannon's disease uh, they, it's caused by a loss of function in uh, LAMP2, which is a lysosomal associated membrane glycoproteins. These, uh, you know, when you have a lack uh, or a mutation or a lack of LAMP2, you do, uh, you're, you do have a defect in autophagy, so some of the clinical features, these patients do develop uh, cardiomyopathy and skeletal muscle myopathy. Eventually, it is lethal for the males. Uh, and as I mentioned, we know that uh, the autophagy pathway is defective in these patients, but the interesting thing about these patients is that they don't, um, it's 100% penetrance in males, but they don't really develop any phenotypes until later, a little bit later in life, suggesting that there might be some other pathway that's compensating for this lysosomal defect. Uh, so first we looked for EV secretion in a mouse model of Dannon's disease, so these are LAMP2 knockout mice, and then we just isolated the large EVs, and uh, we uh, analyzed the fractions by Western blotting. You can see that the LAMP2 deficient mice have an increased level of CD81 positive vesicles in the cardiac tissue as well as uh, more TIM23, our mitochondrial protein. We also obtained a couple of patient samples, so these are cardiac biopsies from two patients that underwent um, heart transplants. It's a male and a female patient, so, uh, and you can see that when we lo looked at the EV fractions, you, they had more CD63 and CD81 positive vesicles in the, in the in the, in the hearts, as well as more TIM23, suggesting that this is a, in fact a, a pathway that's activated in these patients or in LAMP2 deficiency. So just to summarize what I've shown you today is that we believe that cells release uh, mitochondria in large EVs, especially when lysosomal function is compromised or even overwhelmed, as well as when you have a defect in the fusion between the lysosomes and uh, the, the autophagosomes or endosomes. And uh, the resident macrophages, we believe, uh, engulf the released EVs. And uh, I didn't have time to show you this data, but we have, ev we have data showing that after the macrophage take up the vesicles, the cargo is actually being delivered to the lysosome. So that's why we believe that this is an alternative quality control mechanism that the cells can use to eliminate dysfunctional mitochondria when the internal degradation pathways are compromised. So with that, I just wanted to take a moment to thank my lab for doing all the work while I get to travel around the world and present it to all of you, uh, as well as all my collaborators and grant support. And thank you for your attention. Really beautiful work. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, could you, uh, kind of crazy idea, uh, could you reverse the process to import mitochondria into cardiomyocytes to, I mean healthy mitochondria, yeah. to improve <laughs> improve function? Probably, well, so there's a, there's a stoichiometry problem, right? How many mitochondria can you get into cardiac myocytes to really make a difference? Because they have so many mitochondria, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to actually add 
so much mitochondria, so I'm not even sure if that's possible to make a functional difference. But people have shown that you can make cells take up. You can uh, put them in vesicles and they, they do. I mean, mitochondria are transferred bef between the cells, but the question is still why? Is it really a functional uh, thing? I, I'm not so sure. Not for cardiac myocyte, at least. Okay, thank I you. Think. Also, very yes. nice talk. Um, and I know that you're a, a mitochondrial quality control person, but in your conclusion, you said that you know this is an alternative way to maintain quality control. I'm just wondering if the macrophages are taking up these mitochondria, if in any way their phenotype is being altered by this, and are they becoming more pro-inflammatory? And potentially, this could be a unintended consequence of this alternative pathway that if you impair autophagy, and you have to like, you know, expel mitochondria that maybe could that actually promote um, interstitial or other forms of inflammation potentially leading to fibrosis. So have you looked at the, the, the macrophage phenotypes? Uh, not yet, but that's definitely on the to-do list because we do think that even if fibroblasts are taking up the, uh, are, you know, these EVs, are they being activated? Are the macrophages being activated? So those are all questions that we're gonna answer next after we wrap this up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> was a be beautiful, beautiful uh, story. Uh, a, few, a couple of years ago, Andres Hidalgo published a paper in Cell showing that uh, macrophages can eat up a large portion of the, yeah. of the cytoplasm of cardiomyocytes. Uh, is that mechanism uh, different from the, the one you observed? So it is a slightly different, I it is a different mechanism. So I think that there's more than one way that the cell can secrete mitochondria. So that study that you're referring to, they looked at uh, what they called exophers, which are very large. They are two to three microns across. We're looking at less than a micron. Uh, so we're filtering out all of those vesicles. And that, the main difference is that that pathway was dependent on autophagy. So if you couldn't form autophagosomes, you, could no, you couldn't secrete mitochondria through that pathway. Ours is independent of the okay. autophagy pathway. Still occurs if you can't form autophagosomes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Josh uh, uh, had a question for you, but maybe during the, uh, the coffee break he can raise it because in the interest of time, we have to move on to the last presentation of this session by uh, Professor Priam, reprogramming approach for heart retail, trying to keep in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for still staying here. And uh, you know, it's a really pleasure to be here. I also want to thank the organizer, especially Jay and Dr. Fukuda for having me here today. And I'm going to really take advantage of this 18-ish uh, minute and to share with you um, our research, maybe the overview of our research on direct cardiac reprogramming. And as you have already heard from several talks in the past two days, you might already realize that the direct reprogramming approach has already emerged as a promising alternative approach for tissue regeneration. And indeed, back to 2012, when I was still a postdoc in d pass 3 West Harvest Lab, we actually demonstrate the possibility uh, to use uh, direct reprogramming to um, repair and damage heart. And in a mouse model of myocardial infarction, we show that the introduction of only three transcription factor, MAF2C, GATA4, and TBX5, directly convert the endogenous cardiofibroblasts into cardiomyocyte-like cell that we call ICMs. And this conversion also translates into functional improvement and scar size reduction. And using genetic lineage tracing and pulse labeling, we further demonstrate the new muscle tissue around the scar indeed had a fibroblast origin. Um, our paper at that time published back to back with another uh, uh, similar paper from Quang Hua Song in Eric Olson's lab. And in fact, in the same year, um, other labs, including Masaki Ida lab and also Victor Zhao's lab, published similar findings using slightly different cocktail or microRNAs. Well, back to that almost 10 years ago, um, in spite of the excitement, at that time, there were also a lot of doubts and questions. However, I personally believe this is probably too many of the new technology or maybe new concept. It's really due to the infancy stage of ICM reprogramming at that time. And there are many of the technical hurdles and concerns and also many of the conceptual questions as I listed here. So what happened now? 
Um, well, at that time, um, with all these questions, but of course, more importantly, the excitement, and I started my lab in the, at UNC Chapel Hill in the fall of 2012, and um, during the first couple years, we made some progress to better understand cardiac reprogramming. For example, by leveraging the knowledge in developmental biology, we characterized the stoichiometrical control of reprogramming factor and perfected the recipe. And also by doing the epigenetic profiling and also using unbiased loss of function screen approach, we also identify the epigenetic barriers for reprogramming process and the removing which really improve the efficiency and also streamline the process. And also later, we defined the um, role of autophagy in protein remodeling during the early phase conversion from fibroblasts to um, uh, cardiomyocyte. And especially, we find that one of uh, Jun Sakashima's favorite molecule, Backlin-1, actually has a unexpected function in regulating winged beta catenal signaling involving ULK1 and PI3 kinase. Um, and especially using a mouse genetic model of Backlin-1, we demonstrate the improved reprogramming efficiency due to loss of backlink one lead to a further improvement in heart function and reduction in scar size. And over the years, we also generate many tools for the uh, community to extensively uh, study and have fun in doing the research on cardiac reprogramming. And we continue depositing our most popular plasmid to the aging. And if you find something missing on our website, just shoot us an email. And we also continue upgrading and updating our protocols for both in vivo, in vitro, and human mouse cardiac reprogramming. And also, the labs, the folks in the lab, um, always love to solve puzzles. And that paper um, studying the isoform specific effects of MAP2C, a core reprogramming factor almost appear in um, most of the cardiac reprogramming cocktail, maybe give some answers to the seemingly inconsistent result from um, a different lab, even using the same cocktail. And our understanding and refinement of cardiac reprogramming has also benefited from the quickly evolved single cell genomics approach, which really help us to address the two challenges, perhaps um, to, for any of the reprogramming process, asynchrony and heterogeneity. Now maybe back to almost eight or nine years ago when I was a still starting assistant professor, um, our fearless postdocs Ching Liu and Li Wang and grad student Josh Welch together with me and we test out the very early single cell perform, uh, platform. At that time it's not 10X genomics, it was still the food line. And we used the single cell RNA-seq and together with the mathematical modeling, um, so they were able to reconstruct how a marine fibroblast became an ICM and demonstrate the stepwise transcriptome shift during this process and also identified and characterized the intermediate population. But most importantly, and they were able to go back to this route and took advantage of this unprecedented high resolution and answer many of the long lasting but difficult to be answered question using traditional approach. And I want to especially highlight one example in figure two, I remember, uh, where they discovered the importance of alternative splicing during the process and identify a previously unrecognized function of this splicing factor called PBVP1 in governing the fibroblast alternative splicing, um, therefore can control the fate conversion. And although we published the paper now almost like six years ago, but uh, when we present the data, people also wonder, so what's the in vivo role for PDBP1? And we promise we are going to study too. Um, today I'm also going to share you with you very preliminary data because after a couple years, and especially with the interruption by COVID, and we finally uh, acquired the PDBP1 flux allele that were able to cross with the TCF21, Mir Creamier, and our lovely grad student, Shay Rickert, and took over the project and start to look at the in vivo role of PDBP1 during cardiac fibrosis, where she used a um, engine tensing to induce the chronic fibro fibrosis model. And again, this is very like hot from the oven and very recent preliminary data, and she found that the PDBP1 conditional knockout 
only in the cardiac fibroblasts, indeed reduce the ventricular fibrosis. So she is actually going to introduce the reprogramming factor now in vivo to see what happened. Will there any be um, even synergized the beneficial effects? So she will continue taking this as uh, her thesis project. And of course, in addition to our lab, uh, to follow from that 2017 paper, um, the three uh, leading authors also already start their own laboratory. And I'll just give you some update about their doing, extend from that uh, great paper. And Josh actually uh, really excited continuing about advancing the methodology of machine learning and want to use you know, his expertise in all the mathematical modeling to define the complement of cell types and cell fates and uh, as well as the cell states, not limited to cardiac reprogramming, but perhaps also for other reprogramming process. And Li Wang really want to focus on the immune regulation of ICM reprogramming and study also how aging affects the cardiac fibroblast plasticity. And Zixin recently started her lab at uh, uh, Medical College Wisconsin and want to continue her passion on alternative splicing um, and studying the RNA binding protein in reprogramming as well as combine her expertise in angiogenesis and want to see if adding some reprogrammed endothelial cells, what will happen in vivo. And uh, two years after we published the mouse work, and another talented postdoc, Yang, actually, who gave a really beautiful talk yesterday, um, reconstruct the molecular route of how a human cardiac fibroblast turned into an ICM. And thanks to her, and I can simply skip talking about slides because she already gave you very, uh, some of the detailed information about her finding. And, um, and I can move on then with all this uh, single cell study. And we believe we sort of create a rough Google map for cardiac reprogramming where we believe a fibroblast can be analogous to a car and set to go home. And our trajectory really can help the car to identify this turn around route, which is the refractory route that we um, identify using the single cell RNA seq. And also can help us to identify those roadblocks and perhaps those are the epigenetic barriers and find hospitals and gas stations and those are probably those genetic or epigenetic facilitators. And um, um, with this Google map, we hope the car can continue going and find being the home in our fastest way. And our early study mainly used the R a single cell RNA-seq. And more recently, we started to incorporate the epigenome information also to the uh, map. And uh, uh, Hao Fei, uh, uh, Hao Fei um, and another postdoc in the lab, so they actually used a single cell ataxic technology and to look at the chromatin accessibility dynamics during this early conversion process. And with this technology, and they can perform the integrative analysis of the single cell ataxic with our single cell RNA-seq. And they were able to identify additional transcription factor that play important role during the fate conversion. And for example, they um, uh, showed the dual role of uh, SMAD1, early uh, SMAD3, early on inhibiting the process while later on facilitating the conversion. And they were also able to uh, discover a global rewinding of the cis regulatory interaction of cardiac gene during the conversion from fibroblasts to uh, ICM. And we continue building and refining this Google map by incorporating translatome information, protein zone information, as well as perhaps even the, the three-dimensional chromatin conformation information as well. And we hope to give you guys also updates in a year or two. So I've talked a lot about the Google map. So now how about the car? And uh, you know, so the car cannot go back home uh, without a really great engine, maybe even you know, inside of car one will be uh, all the fancy design, everything, right? So we decided to go back to look at the car, the fibroblast, and maybe to recharacterize and redefine the fibroblast subpopulation in a live heart and especially under disease condition or um, you know, with aging or with different genetic background. And today, um, due to the time, I'm not going to 
uh, share with you those studies, but just want to you know, point out we have done some of the early work using the single cell dual omics to look at the subpopulation of cardiac fibroblasts and with the hope um, in the future with additional information to identify the optimal fibroblast subpopulation for more targeted reprogramming. However, today I'm going to use this paper as a transition to another more fun project. And uh, I, I always love this slide. So it's not a traditional like hypothesis driven or purpose driven like research. This is really a curiosity driven research and I myself as a mentor also really enjoy the process with the two leading author from on that project. So, um, from the previous paper, I just showed you that there is a panel in a figure that, you know, it's not, not, not that obvious to the paper, but we notice that when we look at the enriched motif in cardiac fibroblasts using the single cell dual omics, remember that we have the RNA seq together with the ataxic, we find there are 42 transcription factor motif in fact, enriched in the fibroblasts. And um, um, surprisingly, actually more than half of those transcription factors belong to the basic helix loop helix factors. And uh, keep this in mind, and I'm going to, you know, switch the gear a little bit, but just keep that data in mind. Um, Harvey and Ben, the MD, PhD student Ben, um, they, actually started a completely different project and looking for potential shared mechanism among three different reprogramming and they picked up IHAP reprogramming representing endoderm and ICM reprogramming rep representing mesoderm while the ineuron reprogramming representing um, ectoderm. So they look at the enhancer, super enhancer, enhancer promoter dynamics, as well as the transcriptome. And of course, and they also perform the quality, quality control to make sure the reprogramming process occurred successfully. And I just uh, skip all the expected finding, but just tell, with you, tell you the unexpected finding. So what they found is during repro eye neuron reprogramming, um, they, they found that those enhancers enriched during uh, neuron reprogramming, not only just uh, for synapse and dendrites and neuron related geo turn, they found those muscle tissue development and the striated muscle development, those geo turn also get enriched, which is also true for the gene expression and also true for the super enhancers. And with multiple information, they believe this is perhaps not some false, net, false positive results and also not, not possibly to be some technical caveats. And uh, they uh, went on to see what are those weird results caused. So they find out this is indeed caused by the neuron factor ASCL1. And amazingly, when they overexpress this ASCL1 alone in the fibroblast, it was able to activate also the muscle program by not only the RNA-seq showing here, but also the qPCR using a selector of cardiac markers. And when they compare the gene profile with um, the reprogramming cell using the traditional cocktail, GMT or GHMT, and they find out um, this ASCL1 can activate a group of genes that were also able to be activated by GMT or GHMT. But importantly, ASCL1 was also able to upregulate a group of genes that would not be able to upregulate it by GMT or GHMT. So Ben and Halfway actually move on and want to try the crazy idea whether they can use this neuron factor to boost the cardiac reprogramming. And in fact, they were able to use the ASL1 to boost the GMT mediated cardiac reprogramming. So they then even um, use them, take like one factor out approach, find that the ASL1 together with the MAC2C is sufficient to induce cardiac reprogramming. And showing here, you can see those A and M um, 
generated ICM, they have sarcomere structure, they um, exhibit oscillated potassium um, uh, activity, and they have also the physiolo uh, physiological features as ICMs. And also, um, transcriptome-wise, they also shifted from the fibroblast program to the cardiomyocyte program. So what's really going on there? Now we have to go back to the BHLH transcription factor. So if we open the textbook, we know that the BHLH transcription factor refer to the transcription factor that have the basic helix loop helix binding motif uh, that can allow them to bind to the E-box domain of their target sequence. And um, many of the uh, developmental factor that can govern the cell phage transition, indeed, they are belonging to the BHLH transcription factor that include the ASL1 in neuron and also HAND2 that we are all very familiar with for cardiac development. Mm -hmm. And when Ben and Halfe compared the structure between these two factors, they found that the alpha helix arm one for the ASL1 indeed is much shorter than the alpha helix arm one for the HAND2 really allowing for the more potent and efficient binding of ASL1 to the downstream loci. And we sort of believe that perhaps ASL1 is a naturally existent, um, almost hand to equivalent in the neuron. And however, in this reprogramming system, we can fully take advantage of the nature and feature of the ASL1. And further, when they do the reprogramming and perform the single cell RNA-seq, they found compared to the traditional MGT reprogramming, and A plus M reprogramming now give rise to a new population of ICM that upregulated a number of cardiac structure um, and function genes. And also when they try to reconstruct the molecular route, they now identify a new trajectory called the trajectory number four that seems to um, lead those fibroblast cells to the myocyte fate faster and also more efficient. So they conclude that the A and M indeed navigated a very different ICM trajectory. Now, I also want to remind you that, right, so from our single cell geomic data to analyze fibroblasts, remember that I also told you um, almost a half of the enriched motif is actually belong to the BHLH binding motif, meaning that naturally in those fibroblasts, there are a lot of open chromatin region that reside in the BHLH, those uh, binding motif domain. So all putting that together, uh, so Ben and Halfe actually performed even more experiment doing all the different chip seek together with the ATAC seek and also the RNA seek to look at how the A and M dynamically uh, you know, function with each other to activate the pro a cardiac program, but also restrict the cell only go to the cardiac. So the, yeah, the, so for the details and the, you know, just read the paper recently, also accepted it and also online. I think I'm also going to be done, yes. Um, and from the paper, we believe the take home message is that in the traditional way of thinking about reprogramming, so we always think about lineage specific transcription factor model, like for the cardiac reprogramming is uh, mapped to CTBX5 and GATA4, maybe we can now change about our thought and we can, uh, with uh, this ASL1 story, we probably only need a potent binding factor to allow us um, targeted opening of the chromatin and with a lineage specific restriction factor, here is the map to see. And you know, uh, along, along that story, we also want to see whether we can um, use the single hybrid or chimeric protein model and only take out the powerful binding motif as well as the activation motif to make a chimeric protein to allow reprogramming happen efficiently and also easily and how to deliver, and I like to use John's RNA therapeutics. We, we probably want to use the RNA uh, method in the future as well. So yeah, I'm done with that. I'd like to also thank all the lab members, previous lab members, and also current lab members in the lab, and also the funding source, um, uh, as well as many of our wonderful collaborators and talk facilities. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. We have time for one question and one short answer. Yes. Lee, um, it's a very significant and very difficult study. I um, congratulate you. And uh, after 10 plus years, we now believe you can do it. And uh, the question is how do you achieve that efficient? And what's the strategy to make it efficient in vivo? Yeah. Once the efficiency is overcome, then how do you deal with the fact that may have a rupture problem if you have uh, increased the efficiency, then uh, there's some new large piece of tissue in the pump that pumps pressure to increase to zero to 100 millimeter mercury and then um, rupture is a concern. And yes. after that, there's the uh, arrhythmia problem. Probably will, physician will take care of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, I think, so all the questions are great and I think we uh, will solve the problem one by one. So that's why we believe the basic research has still need to be keep going on and to address the question from the standpoint of basic science because see like the ASL1 story led us to think maybe we only need a more like synthetic protein that can allow us for more efficient reprogramming and for delivery um, yeah, there are several companies already to use the AAV approach but now we are also thinking you know in the future use a modified mRNA nanoparticles those approach as well and in terms of other side effects like rupture or arrhythmia uh, we also think you know the, uh, for the reprogramming type of therapy, we have to really design it in a very tailored way for specific disease type and for specific patient. For example, um, so just to think about acute versus chronic. Short answer. Yeah, oh, okay. So we can, we can chat about that uh, at the coffee time. Uh, but it's also, we might use some cocktail less efficient rather than more efficient, but some other cocktail that can target more specifically to certain population and in a mind way to reprogram, not causing too much program. But we can chat more at the coffee break. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. Well, thank you to all for attending the session. I think there is a 10 minute break before the next one. Let, let, let's thank you. Let's, let's move on, we, let's catch some time. So uh, people take a break, go out, take a break. 11 o'clock, let's start that session. And I will take the opportunity to have two announcements. Um, first of all, let me thank everyone. Um, it's a great scientific meeting and a su meeting successful because every one of you. So uh, for trainees, um, please send me your mailing address. Uh, thanks that uh, Dr. Buxton always support trainees. I will need to send you a check. So send me the, your mailing address and I'll, um, UAB will send you a check for the award. And um, again, the, the ones uh, not the get uh, uh, finalist awardees, they are winner also. This is a uh, uh, very uh, successful meeting and you are selected to present the, the abstract, so you are winner also. Um, second announcement is uh, during the past two days, um, I've been in contact and uh, asked for put the uh, proceedings together, but I think we probably have to put a review it's better than the proceeding. So we have uh, more than 40 invited speakers. Putting in one review is a tough job. I will need a volunteer to help me to handle that. I probably can do one review. So um, in senior investigator and the password around many people due to their busy schedule left already. So we will ask each of the invited speakers send me half page, single spaced, uh, summary of your work, whatever you like to do. And then uh, I will try to um, put the review together. And in the past, everyone knows that we have the published, in the past seven, actually eight years, we have published our review or statement in Science Translational Medicine, in JACC, in Circle Research. So we publish, because of you, every one of you, we publish high impact journal review and statement. So um, you will receive an email from me or uh, Dr. Yuji Nakata to ask you if you want to participate in this review. Uh, we will ask you for a half page to one page single spaced summary and I'll take care of the rest. And finally, when you receive the revision, just be, um, be kind because there's uh, more than 20 people co-author, so if everybody keeps changing, then we'll never be able to publish it. 
So, and we can talk more uh, online, offline, and uh, so let's move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you.